Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. It's Derby Weekend. And if the Kentucky Derby is the greatest two minutes in sports, then Raw is the slowest three hours on television, and AEW is the place where old racehorses go to die. And to join me in talking about all this and more, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's living proof that jackasses can't run with racehorses, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again, and I've been out running all those jackasses for so many years. Thank you for mentioning that here on the top of the show. <laughs> I, I got to mention at the top of the show what you just blurted out of your chicken lips moments before we went on the air. We were commiserating. This is, see, this is unscheduled. This is a lights out discussion here. You didn't know this was coming. We were discussing and commiserating about our various shitty soggy wet cold drizzly rainy weather i was yesterday was thurby here in louisville the thursday before derby thurby that's where all the people that actually live here in louisville go to churchill downs they stay away from the derby mostly that's for the tourists and it was kind of bleh but today they're calling for storms. It's Kentucky Oaks Day, st strong storms all over the area. Tomorrow it may be dry for Derby. And then it's after being barely getting out of the 60s, it, I said it's going to be 90 here almost for the next few days next week. And you said to me, you said, oh, yesterday was perfect. It's dark today. It's miserable. But yesterday was so nice. 75 degrees. The bugs were out. It was perfect. The, are those indeed the words that came out of your mouth? Those are indeed the words that came out of my mouth, yes. Because Can the you... bugs come out on nice, beautiful days. Well, so does everything else, but I've never heard anybody phrase it like that. The, the, the parameters of a, a nice spring weather day or if the bugs are out or not. I That's, know. That was the first thing out of your lips. I know. If I have to come up with a strategy to destroy a family of bees, it's probably a nice day. <laughs> it's probably not a rainy day. It's probably a beautiful day. What? what and I want to lay out there without the fucking bees swarming around. How are you going to destroy a family of bees? What are you going to plant some kind of fucking incriminating photographs of the Mr. Bee in the in with the queen and she sees him and divorces him? How are you going to destroy this family? Oh, oh, come on. That's all Hollywood. No, I wouldn't do anything like that. I would just smash him with a shovel, which is what <laughs> I did. Which is what I did. It became a fun thing. You hold the shovel real, like, up close, open grip, uh, kind of like Ty Cobb, and you just swat him out of the fucking sky as hard as you can. We individually. In the, well, we, it's hard to get them all at, like bunched yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, it would be. That's what that'd be like the Sadahara O of uh, bee killing. Yeah. Well, first of all, what kind of shovel you got that you can swing a shovel at a fucking lighter than air bee, and and it, he can't evade that fucking. You don't have a man shovel then. I that absolutely do. I just happen to have a man's arms too, and I could swing them real good <laughs> and real fast and real strongly. To quote Donald Trump, real strongly, did, I can kill these bees. Did you ever consider, you blithering simpleton, that while you're taking this blunderbuss to one innocent, lonely bee, that there's a hundred or a thousand or however many other bees that there are in the the hive, the colony, the, the congregation? Oh, yeah, the thing the exterminator they're takes they're care of. They're coming at yeah. you from behind. Uh, no, that's what the exterminator takes care of. When I say, Suzanne, call the exterminator... In the meantime, I got to take care of some of this right now because I want to sit down and enjoy the sun because it's going to suck tomorrow and it ended up sucking tomorrow. I was correct. I, I, again, how is that an appropriate? You're a, an executive, a graduate of a major university. Well, no, that's not a, true. No. A, a king of podcasting. Well, that's true. At least I hit one of them. And, and <laughs> you think the best use of your time and energy and, and manly arms is out there swinging a shovel at bees on an individual basis. I don't think that's the best use of my time, and I never said that. However, it is a fun exercise if you're out there. <laughs> you're trying to enjoy the sun. You have no shirt on. There are bees. Go to the other side of the yard. Go it just so yard. happens that this shovel's over there. What if I what just start like, knocking him? How far can you hit a bee if they're in flight coming at you and you hit it? Can you get it to go 100 feet? No, you can't. 
Well, you can't because you don't have manly arms. No, I got no, these big manly of, arms. I can swing these bees all over the place. Here's the thing. A bee is lighter than air to begin with. So if you're hitting this fucking bee, even if you've knocked him senseless, and even if he is, is he's not going to go 100 feet because wind resistance, especially on a blustery day, is going to probably blow the car no back at you. And then you'll have... As Dead I said, bee all over you. The perfect day, no bluster. No bluster. No There's bluster. Plenty of bugs and bees. You know what it sounds like when a bee hits a shovel? What? You know what the first thing and is? And you can feel it. You feel the little vibration in your fingers. It's oh, kinda, God damn it's it. It's kind of neat. You feel, a, you feel a vibration in your manly arms from a bee. I feel the vibration. <laughs> you know what the first thing it is? It goes through a bug's mind when he hits a windshield of a car. What's that? His ass. <laughs> oh, there you go. Thank you. What, how are you. How are you fixed for snakes now? Is it going to be good weather enough for the snakes to come out here shortly? Again, I think that falls under the exterminator's uh, auspices. I just handle the day-to-day -day operations. Now you need to take a <laughs> shovel to a snake. What do you do? How would you handle a snake? Have you handled the snake? And how I would have you handled handle a couple of snakes. Not big ones. House snakes, now, not Jake the snakes. Not, not, not like... But just the the snakes that you might find, especially in the old days, wandering around out here in the uh, in the suburbs, I've taken a shovel to a couple of snakes, and one, believe it or not, believe actually you will believe this, and you'll have a smart ass remark to make. The closest encounter I ever had with a snake coming into my home was in Connecticut. Bruce. <laughs> no, no, no. I never invited him. But <laughs> no, I, I came home one day and pulled in the garage and hit the garage door closer gimmick. And the garage door goes down. And then I, I go in the house and I come back about an hour later because I think I need to get something out of the car, trunk, whatever the case. And I said, well, what? Well, my weather stripping on the bottom of my garage door has, has gone sideways as, has come off or whatever. I see this strip there. And as I get a little closer to it, like I'm going to bend down and pull it up or whatever, I've closed the garage door on a snake and the snake is starts wiggling. That's how I knew it wasn't the insulation or whatever. And I, well, fuck you. And I found me a shovel and there pretty soon there was a snake in two pieces. If you say it in a gruffled voice, it sounds like a Jake promo. And then you put the garage <laughs> door on a snake and you cut me in half. But you need a shovel to finish me off. <sighs> yeah. Well, I'd, actually, I needed a shovel to pry him out of my car when I used to have to drive him around up there because he had no driver's license. But um, but how did we get on the snow, the snakes? You're, you're <laughs> either forecasting or the platitudes you use to, to describe a, a good day. So the, if the bugs are out, folks, it's a great day in the neighborhood for the last family. What, yeah. how, what's your stance on the leeches? We haven't had a problem with leeches uh, ever. In months, right? Well, ever. I don't think we've ever had a problem with leeches. I mean, you're talking in a corporate level or are you talking about outside on the grounds? <laughs> I'm, talking <about> the, <laughs> I'm talking about the ones that suck your blood. I'm Oh, I got to <laughs> narrow it down even more. I'm talking about the ones that attach themselves to, well, talking about the slimy one. Oh, never mind. You know what? I got busy <laughs> over the weekend. Actually, this is the end of the week. I got busy over the week. What day is this? I know. <laughs> this is my show. They're all the same when you have my life. You record, watch wrestling, sign action figures. But I did something over the past couple of days since I talked to you last on the drive through your, your fine program. I actually did something else besides those things uh, to try to get some space here in the house and, and, and clean up the vault a little bit. I mentioned a few weeks ago we had the electrician come in, fix the attic exhaust fans. It's going on summertime. The motors on the old ones had burned out. Needed to get those replaced. Got to do that. I had to move a bunch of stuff out of what well, both of well, one of the attics in in particular. And I finally decided, Brian, you know I'm it can possibly be I can be described as obsessive about some things. That's, uh, some people say this, right? I don't know if I agree with it, but like my record keeping or documentation or 
parameters I live my life by, whatever the case may be. Well, they say you're only, you're a financial wizard. They say you're only supposed to keep your financial records in case of any sideways hey rube with the IRS for seven years, right? That's what they say, but of course you're you're allowed to keep them as long as you want. Well, but I'm talking about, you know, the actual receipts and blah, blah, blah. You're allowed to keep them. I had I had the past 17 years in the attic. And I decided, you know what? And also, besides that, but see, I'm not talking about just, uh, you know, the regular stuff you turn into the government and stuff you turn into the accountant. I'm talking about the raw material. <laughs> I'm talking about everything. It sounds like you're building up a product for Cornette's Collectibles. Yeah, well, no. We don't just have the no. tax returns. I'm talking about the raw materials. Yeah, I'm talking about, see, here's the thing. For... The past three decades or whatever it's been, anytime I spend more than $5, I either get a receipt or write it down or both. And anytime I take in any amount of money, I write it down, obviously. But all those receipts, they're not necessarily all tax deductible, right? I have every electric bill i've paid every water bill every time that i've had the pest control people over every piece of paper that i get through the course of the year i put in separate files by obviously genre like electric bill phone bill this and that and the other thing and then at the end of each month i write everything down in a book here's everything i spent personal business here's everything i took in then at the end of every quarter, I type that up into another file that I send to my accountants. And at the end of the year, I do the grand overview. And then also I did have, which this may be excessive, a piece of paper with every individual merchandise order that's come into Cornette's Collectibles in the past 13 years. That alone amounted to about 400 pounds of paper. I say, you know, maybe I've got some duplication going on here because I also have every tax return that I've ever filed with the government for the past 40 years filed away year by year. And I've got those monthly and yearly books and I've got those quarterly reports and those annual summaries. So I think I can get rid of my Wendy's receipts from when I used to go to TNA in 2007, right? So I've systematically begun a purge of this. And now I've, I've alleviated, I would say, five or 600 pounds of stress on my attic floor that's right over my head. So if all my, fin I'd be the only person in the world to be killed by a cave-in of my financial records. What a way to go. Do you think I'm excessive in this, in this, it's all by hand. I don't know how to do the computer spreadsheet type of thing. But one of these days, somebody can do a forensic examination after I'm gone and determine how much money I've spent at Wendy's over the past 30 years. Well, you'll find out more things like that at the Jim Cornette Library after it's open. <laughs> Where will we put the Cornette Library? Well, that's up to you. I mean, usually the president decides where the presidential library will go. I guess it's based on where you can get some real estate, if I had to guess. More than well, I've else. got some right here. You think I can get the government to buy the castle after I'm gone and turn it into a shrine? Well, actually, if you really think about it, considering when your house was built, the fact that it's an original house and it's still there, even with some renovations, it probably could, and some would argue based on wrestling importance, should be declared a national, I don't know about monument, but a historical site that can be protected. Yes. And then you could turn it into the Cornet Museum. Well, there you see. And everyone can look, but no one can touch. Exactly. We'll have people, we'll put a glass dome over it, and we'll just have people walk around it in circles and point. When I was a kid, one of the coolest things, it's cooler in retrospect, sometimes, I don't know, it was a hot day and there was no AC, but in camp, they would take us at least once a summer to Teddy Roosevelt's home on Long Island, Sagmore Hill, and it was kept exactly as it was when Teddy Roosevelt lived there while he was president. And it was awesome. You just wanted to sit down, but you couldn't. And you had to touch <laughs> all these things and you couldn't, you couldn't do anything. And then they let you like sit in a room and watch a film about them. 
And then they put you back on a bus and you realize their gift shop had no candy. Like I said, in retrospect, it was really cool being there, but yeah, <laughs> I probably enjoy it a lot more now. Sounds like the boys ziplining adventure on South Park. He had giant animal heads everywhere. I was like, wow, this really is Teddy Roosevelt's flesh. <laughs> Everywhere you turn, a giant bear is coming at you, or it's on the rug, or there's a deer head. <laughs> what about those mongoose? Oh, I didn't, I didn't know. I don't know if the, they had those there. I have to they go. have the mo- That is the plural of mongoose, right? The mongoose? I don't know if he had a mongoose or multiple. I guess it would just be, or mongoose, not multiple mongoose, just mongoose itself is multiple. Yeah, mo- that would be redundant. Redundancy repeated redundantly. So this is a really interesting episode we've had so far. Moving on. You know, <laughs> and by the way, I, I mentioned signing action figures. Folks, I, another 150 boxes of action figures passed off to the fabulous Feather Bottoms yesterday. And I believe we are on a pace, as long as nothing bad happens to me, keep your fingers crossed, folks, that uh, by the the first week of June, everything that was purchased during action figure Armageddon will be signed and shipped to the fine customers at Cornette's Collectibles. Of course, if you're ordering non-figure-related stuff, T-shirts and autographed pictures and everything, the Feather Bottoms ultra-careful handling system, fuck for short, will take care of you. Uh, you don't even have to wait now, thanks to the their speedy assembly system, for me to get through all the figures. Uh, but again... The people who have ordered one of the bloody variant and one of the commentator playset, we're addressing you fine folks now. The first ones have started going out, and those should be out over the next 10 to 14 days. And by the way, there still are a few commentator playsets available. Order now at jimcornette.com. There is my commercial announcement. All right, and you endorse you- this message. Can you, yes, can you endorse this message, please? Can I endorse it? Yes, go ahead and endorse this message. If I'm endorsing the message, I'm endorsing the feather bottoms? Well, you can endorse anything you want. Just endorse it. Just say, I endorse that. I endorse elements of that, but I'm not going <laughs> to clarify exactly which elements they are at this time. No You're gonna comment. Pick it apart late, later. That's pick right. it apart later. Speaking of picking things apart, before we get into the entertainment portion of our programming nobody's entertained by this you know i hate to be right i always say that i hate to be right i hate to say i told you so but it happens so often you would think more people would start listening to me at this juncture you heard about what the supreme court's trying to pull on us and a lot of people have asked me if i and yes not on youtube But on the podcast here, if I would address that, because I've already addressed it, I warned everybody. I told you exactly what, and it's not like I'm the, the genius that thought of this or realized this or has seen this coming, because a lot of other people have too. I'm just talking about my particular audience. I warned you. Other people have warned. Everybody's been warned. The Supreme Court is now trying to fuck up everybody's abortion rights. Settled science over the past 50 years, settled law, settled science to me, that's the problem with it, is it's related to science, and they don't like that. Because republicanism is where religious fanatics and and conspiracy theorists unite to hate science together. The news came out for the international listeners who continue to be bum-fuzzled and amazed at the Americans. It was a leaked document this past week that has basically told the world that the Supreme Court is about to, already has decided and is probably going to announce sometime in the next couple of months when they get the gumption now, that they're going to overturn Roe versus Wade and make abortion once again either, it's it's going to be effectively illegal in 20-something states because of the backward Republican administrations of those states and it's going to fuck up everybody in the country and they they thought they were going to slip it by before anybody knew it was coming so some well thought of well thinking well-meaning person has leaked this which never happens 
out of the Supreme Court because they knew the people were going to be fucking outraged and maybe something can be done, but who knows? It'll probably uh, come to pass. And, of course, the Republicans are not mad at the decision. They're mad at the leak because they didn't want all this, oh, you're going to do what? Before it had already happened. They thought they could slide it by because I think the last the last poll that they took was 70% of Americans are happy with everything just the way it is or would like more access to abortion for some people in some parts of this country that are still back in the dark ages and don't understand scientific medical procedures and think God's going to be mad at them. So in some cases, it needs to be expanded because a lot of people in certain parts of the country don't have easy access to take it afford. They can't take days off work, or travel hundreds of miles. But you don't have to worry about that anymore. This is not even Trump's fault. Trump was a useful idiot. That's why they covered for him. That's why they put up with all that shit, because they've had a 50-year plan. Trump had no ideology except whatever calmed the suckers and the rubes and kept him in office. So the Republicans used him to appoint the inexperienced, unqualified, incompetent judges to vote the way that they wanted when shit like this would come up so that the minority could rule because the minority would be making the laws. So they covered for all of other, Trump's other shit. Meanwhile, he was appointing people that were going to lie for him and try to keep him in office. He thought. But that didn't work out for him. But it's worked out for them because they were smarter than he is. He was their fucking hand puppet. And they had their hand firmly up his fucking ass. So now, these people are, as I've mentioned before, are in control and making laws that all of us have to live by based on their delusional beliefs of an invisible supreme being and what he'd be pissed about. Because I know that there's people that, oh, I'm against abortion for this reason or that reason or what it all comes down to God and what God wants. That's why the religious groups and the right-wing conservative fanatical groups are the only ones that are violently protesting this business because they share a common gullibility. Can you imagine in the year 2022 telling people you've got to have children that you don't want and can't pay for or take care of because I believe that you have pissed off my imaginary friend? I, 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 they say they're pro-life. These are the people that believe that everybody should have as many guns as they want so that this country has as many shootings per year as every other civilized country in the world put together plus more. So that means you can kill all the current real existing human beings you want, but the potential human beings that after six weeks are still a science project, we've got to protect them at the cost of their parents and the rest of their families and society at large. And then they say, don't get pregnant. But if you notice, the Catholics and the other really fanatical religions are against birth control, too. So what? So you're coming or going to make a funny? They got you coming or going. No birth control, but no abortions. These, they don't like science of birth control, but they'll take the antibiotics if they've got goddamn pneumonia. And there's the nutcases that think that God wants them to have as many kids as possible so they get reality TV shows. There's 18 or 20 of them and counting or whatever. Those people also apparently have inappropriate relationships in those big old families. That's what you hear in the news because they're teaching these kids fucked up shit about what kind of sex God wants them to have and whether they should admit it or not. Most time it's no. Because the religious people that are also perverts, they're conflicted. They can't just be regular perverts and go out and find other consenting adult perverts and do perverted things. They got to be fucking quiet about it and keep it in the family because God will be upset at them. 
so who's next here? Now that we get rid of abortion rights, contraception, medical treatment for all these women, they're already talking about gay marriage. And they're mad at the gay people specifically, even more than the people that have the abortions, even though nobody has fewer abortions than gay people. But the marriage, oh, God doesn't like Adam and Steve or whatever the fuck the, is on the banner when they have the churches go out and protest people that are just hanging around doing their shit. Has nothing to do with these churches. Because I bet you most of these gay people don't go to those churches. But they got to stick their nose in. If God doesn't approve of gay marriage, that's fine. Because most of the people that want to get married, if they're gay, don't care whether he approves or not. But if the Supreme Court says you can't get married if you're gay, then that fucks up actual people's lives with the inheritance laws and the spousal health decisions and all that shit that actual marriage gives you legal right to that otherwise you get fucked around over. They don't want gay people to have those rights either because they don't want gay people. Because they think that if a fucking gay man prays long enough, he'll start being attracted to tits. Because they're idiots. And they think that an invisible commander formed people in his own image instead of it being a chemical fucking makeup that is different for many people. So if you're gay and you're married, you're fucked next. They think you're horrible people. And what about Brian? Medical marijuana and or just legal marijuana. How many states now? Oh, I don't know how many, but it's sweeping the nation. Better than half. One or the other. Well, that's fucked too. You know why? Because marijuana is a plant that you can grow. You can stick a seed in the ground. I know it's a little more complicated than this, but you get my drift. Any numbnuts can grow a plant. But so that shit has to be illegal because the Republicans are anti-drug unless it's something that keeps you alive or you can get addicted to, and then they make sure that it costs thousands of dollars because nobody gets health care if it's up to the Republicans. We've established that already. They're just taking away some of the shit that you actually have access to and you still have to pay for. So, boom. If you want to be addicted to opioids or you need cancer drugs, they'll be glad to charge you thousands of dollars, but only bad people smoke marijuana, according to, what is his name, Ernest T. Bass down there in, uh, oh, goddamn, little P-head, Jeff Sessions. Old P-head. Now, after that, now, the, the party of rights... They're going to take away abortion rights. They're going to take away gay marriage rights. They're going to take away the right to be gay. They're going to take away the right to have medical marijuana or legalized marijuana, depending on where you are. After that, fuck your voting rights, because they've already been doing this. They don't want you to vote if you won't vote for them. If you're poor or black or a Democrat or now a woman, since they'll alienate all of them except for the fucking goofy Fox News Stepford wife types like Marjorie Treason Green and the rest of those blank-eyed, soulless, blood-sucking twats. So all of those people that they can gerrymander out of voting for common sense, that you're fucked too. And but, but when they do lose elections, they just say that it was rigged and try to get the officials that they put in place to agree with them, and it almost worked last January. Maybe next time they try it, it will. Who else is fucked coming up? Immigrants from anywhere, right? I would rather have a fucking Mexican family of four with jobs and trying to stay under the radar, whether they got paperwork or not, than a bunch of right-wing gun-collecting conspiracy theorists from Alabama storming the Capitol. So let's bring in more of the fucking Dominicans and deport the fucking QAnons from Missouri. 
Just make an even swap. Because they're the dangerous ones, the ones we already got here. <clears throat> so now that they have accomplished their mission and they've got control of the Supreme Court, you're fucked. You're, everybody listening to me is going to be fucked around in some kind of way. Nothing's going to be done on climate change, so you better not have kids because they won't have air or water. Because these morons are... are so wrapped up in the price of gas, they can't understand that we'll get past that. It was $4 a gallon fucking 20 years ago. But you know, this air and water thing, we kind of need the rest of that. Fucking morons. And while I'm on it, everybody on Twitter, well, what do you think about your boy Biden now with the gas prices? I think same thing I did before. The president of the United States doesn't have anything to do with the fucking gas prices, you idiots. Then why is the fucking price of gas in goddamn Australia through the roof? Is it a worldwide plot to not make Biden look bad? God damn it. They're more scared of non-existent marauding hordes of immigrants storming the border and gay people in their bathrooms than melting the planet and having criminals and religious fanatics running the fucking country. And you cannot reason with people that refuse to engage with reality. I've said this many times, so you've been overly warned on what the fucking elected Republican officials are trying and succeeding to do, so if they don't all get voted out, don't blame me, it's your fucking fault. I'm trying to do my part. Vote against them and call attention to them. So, if you're a woman, you're fucked. If you're gay, gay and married, black, poor, a boyfriend or husband of a woman that doesn't want kids, an immigrant, a Democrat, an unwanted child not real overjoyed about the fact that he was born into the situation that he is currently in, if you're a normal person, you're all fucked. So, congratulations, Republicans, conservatives, and assholes. It's all the same thing. Hey, can I ask I, you can I ask you a question about this? Please do. Beyond everything you just said to the actual story here, what do you think about the idea it was a leak? Who do you think leaked it? And I don't not asking you to guess the person, but what do you think the motive was for the leak? Well, I I don't know the small circle I would imagine of people that have access to that kind of paperwork, so I can't speculate on who it was that leaked it, but I guarantee you it was leaked to show people, hey, they're fixing to fuck with you all in a major way, and this is ridiculous, and this is what they've been plotting and planning. That's why they fucking denied Obama's last Supreme Court pick when he had a year left in office, and that's why they jammed fucking President Pig shits down our throat with that goddamn, as they described her at the time, a religious fanatic, Amy Comey Barrett, Coney, Comey, whoever the fuck. I mean, she looked like a goddamn picture of one of those blank-eyed religious women that wears the fucking, what am I thinking, the Amish. She looked like she could be Amish, for fuck's sake. This is modern society. People don't think like that anymore. They've stacked the fucking deck against normal America. And that's... Uh, we're still recovering like the rest of everybody in the world from a pandemic that's killed millions of people and is still here. There's worldwide inflation and price hikes and supply issues as a result of that in every country. Russia is still fucking with Ukraine, which has exacerbated everything, especially the oil prices. And no, of course, Putin wasn't going to fucking invade Ukraine while his cock holster was running this country he didn't want to make donnie look bad but he sure wants to make biden look bad and enough of the suckers here believe it but now that's exacerbated the situation in this country there's sick kids there's no health care there's homeless people the most ridiculous gun problem in the world and by the admission of every stooge around him that's been called to testify under oath 
the last leader of the Republican Party tried to overthrow the fucking government. But these assholes think now the thing to do is to fuck over half the U.S. population and take away their right to decide whether they have kids or not. So I, I leave you with this question. People, the people, what rights does the party of rights try to protect that do not involve guns or God? What right do you have that does not stem from one of those two things in the eyes of the Republican Party? Because I can't find any other ones. Can you think, Brian? I, um... I mean, the problem is... The problem is the term conservative has now been adopted by people who really aren't doing a lot of conservative things. <laughs> no, Mitt Romney looks like a normal one now. Remember when they were all like him, just white nerds, but now they're fanatics. It was, a, it was the party of business. It was the party of business. That was the reason my grandfather liked Nixon. It wasn't because he liked scumbags. <laughs> it's because business did good. And the Republicans were the business party, and then it became a very different thing. And what I want to see is if this is going to actually motivate people to vote in the midterm elections. Is it that should. why this came out now? To get people motivated right now? So that'll be the real interesting thing. Yes, I mean, that had to be the motive to begin with. Hey, folks, what we've been talking about and warning you about is actually coming to pass. If this doesn't scare you to get out and do something, then nothing will. So to the patriotic American and decent human being that leaked it, I get, wait a minute. Because you know they're going to try to fuck with him because they fuck with everybody that tries to stooge him off when they're doing backhanded, underhanded shit. So they'll fuck with this guy too, but just like Vinman, just like the people that stooged on Donnie Dip shit, but they're heroes and history will note them as such, even if there's nothing we can do about whatever the fuck's going to go on here. But again, maybe the Democrats can break the filibuster rule and get something passed real quick, codified as they say, but who knows? Cause they no, dick they won't because they're pussies. Well, that's what I'm saying. The, de that the Democrats dick around and try to do everything nice and everything legal and everything fair. And they're hopelessly outclassed by the cheaters, liars, and crooks. Because the cheaters, liars, and crooks are so much better at all that shit than the Democrats are. Anyway, <clears throat> would you like to go back to YouTube with a letter from our listeners? Hey, Jim, you told me earlier you had an email from one of our listeners. Well, there you go. Funny how that comes up right about. And this is from William. And this is what we were talking about earlier. And on one of the last, as a matter of fact, he says, Dear Jim, and also Brian, if you read this to him. See, he didn't want your feelings to be hurt. Like it's a bedtime story. If you read yeah. it to me. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I just finished listening to the latest episode of The Experience, and I'm excited about the F-U-C-H services that you're now offering. That's from the, once again, the Featherbottoms Ultra Careful Handling System. <laughs> and it reminded me of something that happened to me. I'm in Evansville, Indiana, and we have a street named Fuquay Road. And I'm, I've been to Evansville, so I've seen this, but it's F-U-Q-U-A-Y, Fuquay, right? Okay. One day, I was out with my mother looking for an address in a part of town that neither one of us was very familiar with, so we decided to put the address in our GPS system to have it guide us to our destination. This is the kind of GPS that has a computer read off the directions to me, so I don't have to take my eyes off the road. When it came time for us to turn onto Fuquay Road, the GPS computer didn't really know how to pronounce it, so it took its best guess and told us to turn right on Fuck You Way Road. <laughs> Neither one of us could believe what we heard, and I even purposely went off course so I could make the GPS tell us again to turn around and get back onto Fuck You Way Road, which is how we pronounce it now. Thank you for your time. If you're in Evansville, it's now Fuck You Way Road. That'll spread like wildfire. I thought you said it had something to do with the feather bottoms. 
Well, it was about pronunciations <laughs> we were talking about. <laughs> okay. I've yeah. clearly read that to you. It made perfect sense to me. All right. Nice sip of Sprite. All right, then. Well, what do we hear? Fuquay. This big, big Fuquay or fuck you way. The big news. There's going to be a new wrestling promotion started, a new promotion on the horizon. The man behind it, the son of Chico, of Chico and the man, Freddie Prinze Jr. One of my favorite, ta- I'm, this is the biggest fucking mind-blowing thing to me, is that I loved Chico and the man when I was 10 years old. Freddie Prinze, Jack Albertson, The Garage, The Whole Nine Yards, he was the hottest stand-up comic on The Tonight Show, blah, 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 you saw him everywhere. Even before I, that was right the the same year I started watching wrestling. If you had come into my home, Brian Last, 50 years ago, well, if you'd come into my home 50 years ago, some would have been wrong because you're not that old. I'd be in my time machine. Time machine. If you'd have come into my home and said, hey, that guy that you are watching on network television, I think it was CBS. Every week on this television show, you're going to get into the wrestling business, and 50 years from now, that guy's son is going to start a wrestling promotion, and he's going to make the announcement, and he's going to say one of the things that he's been doing to get ready to launch this wrestling promotion is listening to your podcast as preparation. And then I would have said, my 10-year-old self, what's a podcast? Because there was no such a thing. But what do you think would have been more outrageous for someone to say, there, Chico, on Chico and the Man, (laughs) his son one day will name-check you when talking about getting into wrestling, or the idea that, hey, that guy that fixed your bumper in Chicago, he's going to be a billionaire, and his (laughs) son is going to quote you and start a wrestling company. What's more ridiculous? I'm still going to go with Chico and the man. Because Chico, don't get discouraged. The man, he ain't so hard to understand. I always thought it would have been Buddy Hackett Jr. to get into wrestling, or maybe Don Rickles Jr. I had no idea it would have been Freddie Prinz. You know, Alan Hale Jr. wouldn't have been bad in the wrestling business. He was a big, beefy fellow. But no, so... <sighs> I, and I guess now we might have run and run off and left some of the listeners, but apparently Freddie Prince Jr., who, as we've talked about here when it's come up on the program, and as a lot of people know, apparently was a writer for the WWE for some period of time and is now, I think, doing a podcast telling his stories or whatever. And th- he announced he's going to start a wrestling promotion. And... Not only that, but it's going to, did he say it's, they're going to, the wrestlers are going to have health insurance. We're hearing this again. Every, it, it, usually it's some secretive billionaire that's going to give the health insurance out. And then did Tony Khan ever say that? He's not, he's a billionaire, but not so secretive. I don't think Tony ever said it, but I think. Just the EVPs got it because they're employees. It actually may have been just Cody that ever alluded to it. I don't even know if the other ones ever did in interviews, but Cody did, I think, publicly in interviews alluded to the idea there would be benefits for wrestlers. There were, you're a baseball fan. Is there a Wilpon or Wilton family? Oh, I hate the fucking Wilpons. Yeah, they used to own okay. the Mets. They fucking suck. Okay, well, there was the story going around at somebody. This was maybe seven or eight years ago, and several. No, it was. Several, it was longer. It was right around. It was right before Bernie Madoff. That's when it was. It was before uh, Bernie Madoff with the money. Okay, well, then ten years ago, whatever it was, that that there was somebody connected with them that was going to start a wrestling promotion and give health insurance and benefits and four hundred one ks and several. Members of the wrestling fraternity, veterans, if you will, who you wouldn't think would have bit on that worm, swallowed the whole goddamn hook for a while. But then that, obviously, I mean, it was ridiculous on face of it. With Freddie Prinze Jr., he's not a billionaire. So I can't think that he's going to attempt to start... He wouldn't say this if he wasn't planning to do something. He's not a billionaire, so he's not going to be attempting to or or possibly have the the reach or the contacts to do something the size of what Tony Khan has done. 
but it 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 was a tickle that one of the things he said that he was doing to prep for creating this was listening to our shows out of out of but that's i mean you know where else these days you're going to get a education in wrestling so i guess that's not uh too off off kilter but what i mean is it what can i don't know this guy i've never met him but like i said he's not a billionaire if he was he's in the show business world but there have been other people in the show business world that still weren't able to pull something like this off. So what are the chances and what, what conceivably could this be? I don't know. I guess well, why not? Why don't you know, Brian? I asked you a question. It's your job to answer it. Well, it's your show. I can say that <laughs> I asked the question. I've always heard that he's a really nice guy and he always comes across like a really nice guy. And the idea that he's listening to this show, I'm sure he doesn't agree with everything, but maybe he's listening to pick up on some of the things that you say that are, you know, some of the greatest observations about professional wrestling you could learn from. But I've also heard him do interviews in the past where he talks about his time in WWE, and there's a lot of stuff I think he has liked or been a part of that he's justified, and it's this kind of stuff we don't necessarily like. So when you hear him say he listens to the show, and one of the things he said he wanted for his potential promotion were storylines based in reality, and we could discuss that. It's promising, and I've said we need another alternative to AEW and WWE because we need something that's just completely serious. There's no reason. I watch baseball. They don't just break into goofy comedy in the middle of the game. There's no reason it can't be a wrestling product like that. Question becomes, he already said he doesn't want to book it. Who are you going to get to be the booker? Who are you going to get to be the executives? Who are you going to get to be your talent? That's where it becomes a problem because... You could have all these ideas of things you want to do, and, and it sounds like he is thinking in the right, thinking in the way we would. What we think is the right direction. It sounds like he is at least alluding to that. But who are you going to get to put in there? Because I think part of the problem is you can't keep recycling the same old boobs who just look for anyone with money and just they start salivating in wrestling, and that's the problem. Well, and and quite honestly, there aren't enough people that you describe that are qualified and experienced to go around already to the companies that exist that are paying money that are already up and running. And so there's not like there's a lot left over. I'm, I continue to be amazed. And then when I think about it, know that nobody has hired delirious Hunter Johnston in creative or television production. He's only done it for the last 10 or 12 years straight, but then I'm not amazed because he's overqualified and would you know would probably it'd be like you know bringing in an astrophysicist to fucking tune up your goddamn motor um but wrestling i always say this that AEW was a lost opportunity to develop wrestling executives and the problem yeah. is just the whole uh structure there for good or for bad it's it's not really a structure for that right now but none of, none of the people getting experience as executives or people in production at AEW are going to go on and become future executives and production people in other companies the hardleys twinkle toes right there no uh qt he's he's fairly been a disappointment from what i've heard so i have a jim a list here of some of the things that apparently freddie prince i guess he said this on a show because i'm reading quotes here but okay I well i see i know nothing about his mindset other than this initial uh, uh, announcement that I heard. So anything to narrow down, because the one thing that worries me is when people say they want reality based of uh, angles or presentation storylines. Yeah. Storylines Who's based reality? reality. That's the same thing. Shit stain said, and there's no, there is no reality anywhere on this planet or any other alternate universes that was like shit stains version of reality. So when I hear reality, the concept, yes, but the execution often is what? Yeah, and the other thing is reality is the way wrestling traditionally was. And it, I'm not saying it has to be like old school, but traditionally it was shot the way sports were shot. This right. is the arena. This is where it happens. If there's a confrontation, it's happening out here. And they're arguing about something that's reality based. When all of a sudden it's, we got to get a camera in the back. Someone's being run over and they're being dragged. <laughs> You know, and then the spacemen are landing. Like, that's not reality-based, and that's what I worry about. Uh, but here's some of the things that Freddie Prince apparently said he wants from his wrestling promotion. He wants a two-hour show. 
He wants storylines based in reality. He wants men and women to be given equal time. Uh. He wants to own the space it's filmed in. And he wants to be a SAG show. Of course, SAG being the Screen Actors Guild. Well... Starting with the last first, well, uh, the, the easy one, he wants to own the place where it's filmed. That's the that's the Davis Arena OVW concept or any of the other Arena Mexico. That it, well, <laughs> Arena Mexico, yeah, in 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 uh in that form, that big a place. I don't think he's looking at building an 18,000 seat arena. Of course not, but in lean times, you don't have to worry about where you're going to run a show. Right. And that's why so many of, of independents have modified their places. I mean, a TNA shot at a at a Universal Studios. They had a sound stage, but they they didn't own it, and they were at the mercy of ridiculous rent, especially toward the end. So, yes, a great idea to own your space where you're shooting in, and and that's where you build your fan base, and you know, pick the town carefully, make sure it can support live wrestling. Um. What was the last the last note? He wants the promotion or, or the show, I guess, to be a Screen oh, Actors SAG. Guild show, SAG. This will be interesting because then what differentiates his wrestling from the WWE's wrestling? Except probably for budget. How how would that that will be very interesting to see if he not only allows it but courts it, but it insists on it. And that sheds a light with this union on what these other companies are doing. You see where I'm going with this? That is the same exact thing, probably with, you know, uh, uh, different wording in the contracts, but the same general genre of sport, entertainment, profession, whatever. Why wouldn't they go after Vince and or Tony Khan and or whatever the case? It'd be interesting, too, if the show is filmed in New York or Los Angeles, there's a chance the entire production, down to the wrestlers, could all be union. That'll be a first. But then if you join a union to wrestle for Freddie Prinze, then if the WWE wants to sign you for five times the money, but you're in a union, do you, do you still, can you just not be in the union? Because they won't take you if you're in a union. Well, that's a great question. Or if they don't take you if you're in a union, then is that some kind of criminal enterprise that they're conducting that's a great question jim i think you should consult your union rep on that well as a matter of fact who would be the union rep for a, a business that's never had a union well it would have to be someone from sag does sag get one of their own people or does sag try to look for wrestling expertise in their union well reps? that's what i'm saying who, yeah. and, and who's in sag that has wrestling expertise and then is it is it some nitwit that's done some stunt work and is nobody. And suddenly he's the guy that SAG goes to, to deal with the fucking Vince McMahon and the WWE and all these other places that, I mean, this could be entertaining. Even funnier than that, just situations like, listen, they want me to get color. I don't want to get color. Okay. We'll take care of it. By the way, what's color? I mean, that's, <laughs> a, that's a one I'm running into. <laughs> and that uh, again, Vince McMahon and the WWE, and I still say this, I don't know what Tony Khan's finances are because they said he gets $100 million from the network, but he spent $80 million on a video game and he's paid these guys a ridiculous amount of money. I don't fucking know, but I know that Vince McMahon and the WWE is financially stable enough to give the guys insurance, pay for them benefits, do more than they do without having the government tell them to or an outside union coming in, because we had this talk on the program, and I bet it's out there on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel that just passed 294,000 subscribers. But we had this conversation about unionization, that who, in effect, is the, the union representative, and how in the world would a union work with a business that is completely unique. And one of the things would be, yeah, I need to get you, get some juice when he clocks you with the fucking title belt. And then the union guy comes over and says, you want him to do what? Yeah. He needs to take a razor blade and cut his fucking head slightly. So he'll bleed after junior over there hits him over the head with that 20 pound fucking metal championship belt. Well, that could happen at any point in any wrestling show anywhere in America, but I bet you that that would be the first time 
that any union representative had been faced with that conundrum. So there, there's going to be a learning process. I think Vince ought to do it with his guys without governmental or independent organization intervention just because he fucking can and has the money to and can afford it. But for a lot of these other companies, that'd be entertaining, to say the least. But it was it, it just trying to get Sinclair Broadcasting to understand the promotional side of the wrestling business on a, just a brief basis was hard enough without trying to teach some Hollywood union acting representative, oh, this is the wrestling business. But uh, one of the other things listed here, of course, was two hour show. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't, if, if he can get two hours on something that people can watch, we'll bless him. If he's got enough wrestlers to fill two hours. See, I see two um, hours is too long. I know everyone now is two hours or three hours, but to me, it still goes back to an effective show. I don't even think 60 minutes could be done anymore. 90 minutes is an effective <laughs> show. And what, again, I, I think this is the least thing that we need to worry about right now. What he's saying, I'd like to have a two hour show. Well, I'd like to have goddamn, well, not anymore. I don't have the energy to use it. As goes, I'd like to have a 12 inch dick, but you know, I fuck. It's, it's, then it would just take more time when I'd have to wash it and manscape it and everything before I could show it around. What? But it was, you heard me. But the thing is, whether it's an hour or two hours, whatever, first he's got to get something on a platform that people will watch. So in his perfect world, in his mind, if he could have a two hour show, well, if he got a chance to get an hour on a station of people watch versus two hours on C-SPAN, he'd probably take the hour. I'm not worried about that. The only thing that he said in there that concerns me is women and men getting equal time. And it, then again, you're dooming yourself to excluding talent and just to have half and half for no reason because you're going to find more qualified, talented guys. Than, and I'm not saying there's a plethora of either. And there's not that many... Trained fucking dogs, too. Thankfully, the British Bulldogs aren't a team anymore. There's not trained anybody and talented anybody anymore in, in large numbers. But you're going to find more guys that deserve to be on TV right now than you are girls. So if you're trying to do half and half, then you're excluding some guys who would be better performers just to put some girls on and ain't ready for prime time. AEW is paying a fortune to talent and doesn't give a fuck apparently how many people they sign up, and they still can barely field a women's roster without using the rejects from Twinkle Toes' repertory companies in Japan. So that's the only thing he said there that concerns me. That concerns me too, and I think it's because it's now become just something everyone's supposed to accept and go with if you promote wrestling. You have to have women on every show. And I think the high-end women's wrestlers are as good as the top men's wrestlers nowadays. I We'll talk about Becky Lynch later, but Becky Lynch is a fucking star. You watch her, you're like, yeah, this is a main eventer. I get it. But almost always... There's a more dramatic fall-off toward yeah, the top of the roster. It's a complete fall-off, and usually the person who has the least training or is the least ready for TV that's on TV is going to be someone in a, one of the women's matches, especially in AEW. It's happened way too many times. Big Swole was on TV a lot. Whatever you want to say, Big Swole wasn't ready for TV. And there's a lot of other people like that. But when all of a sudden it's, we're going to have men and women, it's like people forget that for years wrestling focused on just the men's division. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that's what it was. And it worked. Maybe there should be a company that just does that. Because there aren't enough good women wrestlers to go around. And maybe just give the women their own show. Let's get proof of concept already. Oh, wait a minute, don't they have that? They, they, wow, right? I don't, does that, they're the women of wrestling? That's, they've been talking about it for years. Have they actually fucking shot a show? The only thing I know about it is I just saw a bunch of stuff that they fell out with Tessa Blanchard, which probably shouldn't be a surprise. Well, now, or Tessa Blanchard fell out with them, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Oh, we've experienced this chicken and this egg several times. I'm pretty <laughs> sure we know which came first this time. But I think... Just arbitrarily announcing that. We're going to have men and women. Why? What's the actual good reason for that? Just have a men's division. And I think someone should really produce a high-end women's wrestling show. 
and let's get proof of concept. Let's see what kind of audience it draws on its own and what it'll get. Because the top end women's wrestlers are really fucking good. And after that, you have to tie yourself to your seat sometimes not to get up and go to the kitchen or go to the bathroom. Yeah. That's and, the bathroom uh, break match usually. Another thing I will, I will point out is that I have no problem with the top level girls having an athletic contest. And somebody's out he still calls them girls. I, you know what? Fuck y'all. It's girl wrestling. It's the boys. And it's girl Moolah's company was girl wrestling enterprises. Every and, and every midget that I ever met introduced themselves to me as a midget. So blow me. But no, but they introduced themselves to you as a midget, not as a midget blow me. No, I'm just saying for all you people who don't like yeah. that I call them midgets, blow me. Only Lord Littlebrook introduced they himself didn't... that way. Yes. No, he he didn't do that. He was very polite. Where now, where was I going with it? But the the point is, I I am fully behind the great athletic contest between the top female athletes in our profession when they start having fights, grudge matches, hardcore, no DQ, bullshit. I'm sorry. They can't do it. I can't believe it. I can't watch girls in a fucking Terry Funk and Jerry Lawler fucking no DQ match. It's not believable, and that is, the, after all, the ultimate goal of any professional wrestling project is to make the people that are watching it lose themselves in it and believe it. And so I love to see Charlotte and fucking Becky and Rhea and Bianca um, and the top and Serena in some cases. The top girls athletically have top quality athletic contest that's fine the fucking bullshit with the grudge matches i'm sorry then it becomes two girls fake fighting and that's just bullshit well beyond that like i said the top end women wrestlers are phenomenal and is a as you said a pretty quick drop off and it's not enough to justify another promotion having another women's division you can work in WWE, you can work at NXT, you can work in AEW. I think the NWA has women on their shows. I don't know what the fuck MLW does. I don't know what the fuck any of these other indies do. So now he's going to do it? What pool of talent is he going to pick from? Where's he going to get these talented people ready for TV? To be equal with the men who are ready for TV. Wrestling wasn't always men and women. Wrestling was men wrestling. And now they've introduced another thing and a lot of people accept it, but I think... I think it drove a lot of people off. <laughs> Quite frankly, yes, I, I know people don't want to say that and people don't want to admit that, but I think there should be a wrestling option also that just has men's divisions and not women's divisions. I'm, I'm just, it drove a lot of, a lot of things drove a lot of people off from wrestling, but that's one of them, which contributes to the, the problem I mentioned that it's either not fucking badass guys mad at each other trying to pluck their fucking eyeballs out anymore, which is what bloodthirsty people wanted to see in large numbers. It's now an exhibition of entertainment with girls, and, and that was a significant portion of the audience that wanted to see people that were mad at each other bust each, over the head with, each other over the head with shit are not served. And henceforth, they don't want to see it. That's where we lost a lot of people. And the rest of them just because it's just not as good as it used to be. So now with Mr. Prinz, we've got fewer people than ever watching wrestling, but they're watching more wrestling each than ever before. And they're spending more money each on wrestling than ever before, which is the only reason why this thing hasn't completely fallen into the fucking hole because there are so many more people that used to watch wrestling and don't now than there are that actually do the people that do have banded together and crowdfunded AEW and done everything to pick up the slack but we can't keep losing people and now there's a promotion after promotion trying to open and or expand and or operate but there's no new audience being made. And the ones that we drove away have been driven away so well and for such good reasons that they're not anxious to come back. 
except if you gave them what they were seeing until you stopped giving it to them, which was grown adult badass men that they believed hated each other fucking trying to gouge each other's eyeballs out and kick each other in the balls and generally fucking commit mayhem that you could believe not that was made no sense was totally illogical was obviously patently phony requiring cooperation and perpetrated by guys that looked like you could whip half of them so there you go Freddie, did you listen? Did you listen good to that one? And who are the announcers going to be? That's the other problem. It's going to be another promotion. Here's what I fear. I shouldn't say it like it's going to be. I fear it'll be another promotion that starts up with some Michael Cole clone just yelling at you. Because that's the other thing. The tone of wrestling needs to change. It's not just, we need another promotion where they can yell at you and tell you how excited you are to watch this. No, no. We need a completely different tone of things. And there's Freddie Prinze Jr., who was a big enough WWE fan that he ended up working there as a writer. This guy had a film career. He ended up going to WWE to be a writer. That's how big a fan he was of WWE. Is he going to be the person who's going to put all those pieces together, or is this just going to be another NWA, another MLW? I mean, is it even going to get to that point and get off the ground? Will be a Lucha Underground, filmed on a set for a season, and then that's done. We really don't know too much other than he announced his intentions. Well, you know what? If he needs to listen and listen closely to these podcasts that we do to get a firm grip on the classic wrestling psychology, then, then Brian, I've got to think that he needs to, he needs to block out extraneous drivel and noises and talk that he's going to hear and just focus on what's really important, almost like he's hearing it inside his own head. You see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. I think the best way to do that, Freddie, and if you will send me your mailing address, I will make sure that you get a complimentary pair of the Raycon wireless <laughs> earbuds. Will you? I will absolutely do it for a guy like Freddie Prince who needs all the help he can get if he's getting into <laughs> wrestling business. Because you know the easiest way to make $5 million in the wrestling business, start with $10 million. But folks, if you... He also said, just, don't, don't call him Junior. Call him Freddie K. Prince. You doesn't got to call him Freddie K. Why, you could call him Fred, or you could call him Frederick, or you could call him Frederica, but you doesn't got to call him Freddie. But anyway, if you have a mother in your life also, folks, because this weekend is not only the weekend of the Kentucky Derby, it's Mother's Day. So either Saturday or Sunday, bet on your old nag. Folks, personalize your Mother's Day gift or the mother figure in your life or any mother effer you know, personalize that gift with something they really need. And you know, the moms are still the people that do a lot of the work, right? They need their hands. They need to multitask. Mothers are masters of multitasking. They're burping the kid in one hand and they're feeding the kid in the other hand and they're juggling the puppy dog on their foot. They need to be hands-free with vivid voice technology to take phone calls from you offspring that are calling them to say happy Mother's Day and borrow money. <laughs> Raycons are user-friendly for, for those mothers who are just switching to the wireless earbuds. They're easy to set up and easy to use. and They got the seamless Bluetooth pairing, so your blue-haired old mother with her blue teeth will have earbuds that pair up with them. And then she can wear a brown tie. Plus, they come in a bunch of fun color options so mother can have colored things sticking out of her ears sometimes they're jelly beans i know that children sometimes like to hide their jelly beans in their mother's ear kids if you're listening put some jelly beans in your mother's ears the no next time don't do sleeping. that no 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 don't put anything in anyone's ears when they're sleeping or awake well here's what you can put in somebody's ear the optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit these earbuds are so comfortable they will not budge Trust me, I'm telling you, I've, I've seen mothers have these in their ear and they take a belt off the wall and just go to wailing at six or seven of their kids. No, no, these, no, 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 no. These things no. don't fall off. No, there's they no wailing on out. the kids. Stop No it. wailing on the kids. The kids were certainly wailing. For the mom on the go, these Raycon wireless earbuds, the everydays, they offer eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. 32 hours, that's... That's longer than your mother was in labor with you. 
So the least you can do after you did all that damage to her goddamn innards is to get her earbuds with a longer battery life than your labor took, you little fucking ingrate reprobates. But these Raycon everyday earbuds are priced just right because you get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. And besides that, again, if you're so cheap, this is the only thing that you're thinking about to get your mother no card, no dinner. At least you can do is get some Raycon everyday earbuds for mom with 49,000 five-star reviews. Tell mom how much you love her and make sure she hears it in crystal clear audio quality. And believe me, if you get her Raycon wireless earbuds for Mother's Day, she'll get the message. You go to buyraycon.com slash J-C-E, that's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C-E to get 15% off your Mother's Day order. Even if it's a day or so after Mother's Day, I think this will work. Buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. Don't make mom have to take that belt off the wall and go to Whalen. But you know, I wonder, Brian, if maybe Dave Chappelle had his earbuds in and wasn't listening to the sound of footsteps fast approaching him as the guy tackled him on stage at the Hollywood Bowl the other day. Did you see this? I did. I saw various camera angles from various phones in the crowd. Well, and there would have been more, but apparently now with the plethora of preponderance, if you will, of the the camera phones, they've got now a special gimmick where you go into these shows so you can't record them or or whatever. They, I don't know how it works, but they lock your phone in some kind of way so you can't record, but still people were doing it. But there would have been a, a ton more if not uh, for that, but it looked just like when the the guy tackled Rollins here a while back, or the guy that came in the Hall of Fame ceremony and tackled Bret Hart. Just nobody's looking at that particular moment. There's nothing inflaming anybody. There's nothing, you know, provocative going on where somebody's going to hit the ring and rescue somebody, or their Dave Chappelle was not, you know, kicking the shit out of anybody on the stage and somebody need to come to the rescue. They just pick a spot where nobody's paying any attention and roll up the st on the stage or hop over the rail and just run as fast as they can to see what happens. And apparently, who was it? Was it Jamie Foxx that was there also and came out to help? Is it, hey, was that Will Smith? <laughs> and, no, and no, that was Chris Rock that was said, was Chris that Will Rock? Smith? That's what made it the funny thing. Jamie Foxx came out in a sheriff's hat. Which okay, Jamie Foxx was there, but Chris Rock came out and that had the line. Well, it figures. And then they went back. It was like a wrestling deal. They went back around the curtain to watch people put the boots to the fucking guy before they drug him off. But now, uh, again... And no one's complaining. No one's like, that poor man. He did not deserve that beating. That's interesting, too. No one's... Well, no, nobody... Why would anybody say that to begin with? Because that's one of the reasons they say you can't beat up people anymore. You can't even get a jury that would agree with you that anyone was justified in getting their ass kicked. Everyone agrees this guy was justified in getting his ass kicked. I, I stand in firm agreement with that. Uh, and But now it's becoming a thing, I guess, in... I mean, used to every once in a while, you had the streaker at the Super Bowl or whatever, right? Or, you know, Morgana the Kissing Bandit would disrupt the, <laughs> you know, the Major League Baseball games or whatever. You Maybe when you were a kid, you wanted to see Morgana at your Mets game. But it's now, it's it's not heat. It's not people attacking people because of something that they've done that's inflamed the crowd or whatever. It's just mental cases that want to get on TV or be somebody. But now they, they quite Howie Mandel, who is obviously a noted germaphobe to begin with. Now he was quoted as saying in one of these stories, he's scared to perform live anymore. Cause I guess if somebody did come up on stage and tackle you, they'd get their germs all over you too. Yeah, he's also scared to touch a doorknob, so maybe we shouldn't listen well, to Howie he, Mandel. Howie's a slight young man. He's not, you know, he, he's wiry, but he's not a big, you know, uh, a beefy fellow that can take care of himself. So I would think he'd be nervous. But, you know, that's, is this what we're going to have to worry about now, that the 
the potential of some fan or somebody jumping in on any kind of show is going to, is that going to be in the back of everybody's mind? Is it going to start hurting the show or hurting the comedy? Are you going to be funny? If you're a stand up comic, are you going to be funny while you got your head on a swivel, making sure nobody's going to give you a spear at the comedy store? Cause I, I can tell you from experience that crowds in certain places did hurt matches based on what they would have seen versus what they saw because they were so fucking out of control and nobody was riding herd on them. Uh, there's been, you know, numerous instances of that in the territory days, but like I said, it's, it's completely different. Now, any today's wrestler can go out and they can think in the back of their mind, yeah, some nut may jump in the ring or try to tackle me on the way to the ring, but it's probably not going to happen. There's really no reason to believe that lightning's going to strike in this instance, but it's possible. And, you know, and so they still think about that. But in the territory days, depending on the territory or the town you were in, it was either probable to highly likely that that was going to happen. And you still had to, and with less security and less space in between, and you still had to go out and do the shit you had to go out and do. And that did weigh heavily on your mind. Anything from, I've told a story of, you know, Ernie Ladd telling Ox in Cleveland, the natives are getting restless. But a lot of times you knew with a town or just with a, when you heard your finish in a certain town, you would say, okay, we're, we're going to have some trouble here. And other times I've told the stories about Tulsa or Biloxi, Mississippi or Homa, Louisiana, even if whatever the match was, you were thinking probably something is going to happen. And in other times there were towns where you were felt reasonably safe. You would say it would be very unlikely, but still possible because you always were watching, but it'd be very unlikely that here in in the uh, Greensboro Coliseum, with the great police and so much room around the ring, it's highly unlikely anything's going to happen. If it does, it'll happen on the aisle way to and from, not around the ring. And, you know, a different place like Oklahoma City, the Myriad was just so nice. You didn't have to worry too much. But you go 100 miles up the road, and in Tulsa, we were in Tulsa 21 times in 1984, the Midnight Express and I, and had seven of the, what's that? That's 33%. Seven different interaction, riots, fights, people jumping in the ring, police intervention, whatever the case. So that's a third of the time in that town. In our match specifically, there was other incidents that didn't happen with us on shows. And, and, and every once in a while, I've told you about Galliano, Louisiana, haven't I? The name sounds familiar. I don't remember which the, specific the, story. The afternoon show we did, it was a fishing village in South Louisiana. And they've got a little rec center that seated probably, it was a spot show. Maybe they could get a thousand people in there, maybe 800, whatever. It was jammed, but it wasn't a, it was just a small building. And it's a Sunday afternoon, three o'clock show. And we think, okay, it's just a spot show. And we get there and it looks normal. It wasn't that old of a building. And the only thing that made us nervous was the fact that we were so far in South Louisiana that there was literally one road to this town because it was out into the bayou or whatever. So we get, but then we get there and we get in the dressing room and we say, well, we have to literally walk out into the building to get out of the locker room to even go back to the parking lot. So we're on the main event. We're going to have to wait till the people leave. We know that. Because that's the thing. If you were a heel in the territory days, you either tried to get out before the show was over, or if you couldn't do that, you waited until all the baby faces had left. Because then, after the baby faces leave, any fans that are still there are there to cause trouble, and at least you've, you've weeded a few out and you've separated it into the ones you need to keep an eye on, right? And then the cops walk you to your car and they can keep an eye on them too. But nevertheless, the people get there. By the time the bell rings, we're in this concrete block locker room and don't want to go out in the building and stand there and, you know, 
in this crowd to be able to watch the matches. So we're just sitting there. The first match comes in and says, watch the people. And that was, it was the, the heel dressing room. So that's the heel. The first guy out at a show, the first heel would always come back and tell the other heels kind of what the temperature was. And if you hear from the first match, watch the people, you got trouble. So it was like four or five matches on the card. The third match was from Dallas, off the Dallas TV. Fritz had loaned them out. Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin and Precious against Chris Adams. And immediately, Dundee had come in and told Gorgeous, said, just have Precious walk out, get the fucking, get your jacket and come back. We're not going to leave her at ringside. That's not a good sign. Well, they had cops, and they walked Precious in the 40 feet to the ring and the 40 feet back. She was assaulted by, like, six different people, grabbing her and pulling her hair and trying to steal the jacket. They're all drunk, and it's on Sunday afternoon that we get the lowdown from Jack Curtis that it's a fishing village, and everybody came in off the boats on Friday night and started drinking. And some of them sober up in time to go to goddamn church on Sunday morning, and other ones don't sober up until Sunday night because then they go back out on the boat. So it's Sunday afternoon. So they're about as wrecked as they're going to get. So then he gives us our finish. It's the Midnight Express against Magnum TA and Junkyard Dog. And the first words out of his mouth are, heat on dog. I said, what? Well, it's a DQ, and dog can't take the bump over the top rope. We're going to throw Magnum over the top. So heat on dog. All right. And then tag to Magnum. He makes a comeback. He rolls Bobby up. Dennis, grab him, throw him over the top rope, get DQ'd, and get out of there. Cornette, don't interfere. <laughs> you don't have to tell me twice. Then Garvin comes back in. His fucking clumps of his hair pulled out and fucking mud and beer all over him. And he said, watch the people. So we went out there, and within the as soon as the bell rang, a big Cajun threw a beer in Bobby's eyes. He's blind at ringside. We're trying to find him a towel. The cops are surrounding me. There's four or five of them, and they look nervous. And I stood there and hugged the ring post for the entire match. They shined Dog and T.A. as much as they could, and then they cut Junkyard Dog off with a knee in the back when he hit the ropes and the people stood up and started throwing shit. (laughs) And so at that point, they basically got a chin lock on JYD and tagged in and out working that chin lock for five minutes. And then Dennis decided we've given them enough to get the fuck out of here. Tag the Magnum, nail Bobby, nail Dennis, nail Bobby, nail Dennis, bump, 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 bump. Roll up on Bobby. Dennis grabs fucking Magnum, throws him over the top rope. By the time Magnum hit the floor, both Bobby and Dennis were on the floor on either side of me, and we were in the middle of those cops running to the back while the people were trying to swing at us. They heard the announcement that Magnum and Dog were the winners in the ring, and we already got back through the door, and then they diverted them, and they were happy for a second. And we got the fuck out of there, and then the cops... Tell us in the locker room, we're going to lock the door like they used to do in Homa, too. Give us about an hour to clear the parking lot. So we sit there thinking, what are we going to go out and see? They got the baby faces out of the parking lot. They got everybody on the road. Then they got the fans as much as they could to clear the city property, which meant they all had to stand on the sidewalk at the edge of the parking lot. The cops circled us, put us in our car, and then one of the cops got in his car in front of us, and the other one, after, well, they circled the car and walked us off the lot, and one car drove out in front of us to give the people the idea, and then they said, just turn left and don't stop till you get out of town. Thank you very much. Wow. So they definitely didn't get the match they would have got had they not been rip-roaring drunk and fucking ready to fight or fuck at any opportunity. So that that can play on your... And any of the boys that say that they went out knowing they were probably going to have a fucking issue or even a riot and tried to get more heat anyway, they're fucking lying or they're crazy, one or the other. Buddy Landau. 
He didn't want that heat. <laughs> he like no, buddy, buddy didn't mind individual heat with a motherfucker. He would tell you to your face exactly what was wrong with you and what you could do with it. But he didn't want that kind of heat with five thousand people in fucking Monroe, Louisiana. Were there ever could, you know? Were there ever any occurrences of a crowd that did not seem like it was going to be that crowd, and all of a sudden shit just broke down? Other than Beckley, I guess. Were there any examples yeah. of crowds <laughs> that you're like, this crowd seems fine. We can go out there and do our normal, not normal, but we can go out there and work the way the Midnight Express want to work. And then it's like, oh boy, we better calm down. This crowd's getting too hot. Um, there were probably, there were a few of those where you would think, like I mentioned, one of the towns where you were okay. And then, you know, the finish, like, goddamn, where was it? Oh, shit. I'm trying to think. Uh, Lawton, Oklahoma. That's where it was. It's a world-class spot show. And Midnight Express and the Fantastics. And we'd never been there, but, and you know, it's not like it's a teeming metropolis, especially almost 40 years ago, but it was a decent building and, you know, everything looked okay. And we, and we, the, the Dallas crowds did not, you didn't have nearly the heat that you did from the Louisiana crowds. The world-class territory versus Mid-South. We still had issues with people in world class, as I've recounted some stories from time to time, and especially the sportatorium, they could get rowdy. But it wasn't just constant like it was in Louisiana. So we're in Lawton, Oklahoma, and goddamn, I can't remember what, what it was. Oh, I did something. I interfered, poked one of the Fantastics. And one of the guys on the front row stood up and grabbed a fucking chair and folded it up. And I'm yelling at him and Bobby sees it and gets down and grabs a chair and he grabs it and he folds it up. And at that point, every male member of the goddamn East section of ringside stood up and picked their chair up and folded it up. And and Bobby unfolded his chair and set it fucking down. (laughs) And we just kind of got out of there as quickly as we could. You know, I mean, something can happen at any point. We didn't expect, I didn't expect that guy to jump me in Charlotte that time when Dusty did the flying cross body off the apron because there was, you know, two or three cops behind me. But, you know, shit can happen. But, but that's the thing now. It's changed from, you could... It would. It happened much more often then, but you could kind of see it coming because there was a reason for it, you, and it was only directed at the heels, and it was usually not in just some strange place, but rather in a specific point in the match where you would think would inflame somebody. And like I said, now they don't care who they're tackling, babyface, heel, whether they like them or hate them or whatever. They just want to get a name and you know get some attention of some kind because something's wrong upstairs it's a deranged fan not an angry yeah fan. yeah so with that it's happening less but you can never tell where it's going to happen or when because it makes no sense so you know i can see people being especially any of the guys that are, and girls that have never worked the territories and didn't feel what heat was like and didn't go out you hadn't got used to it because now these there are people in the business that have been heels for 10 15 years and have never experienced getting actual heat or anybody trying to jump them or hit the ring or fuck their vehicle up or do any of these things and so it's got to be shocking whereas in those days you got used to it and you expected it and I knew what was going to happen even before I got into business because I'd been a photographer for years and seen all that shit happen to other people and testified in court cases about it. So it, you already had baked that in the cake, as they say. You already knew that that shit was probably going to take place at least a few times a month. And then it, you know, it still wasn't more fun when it happened, but you didn't dwell on it as much because you were kind of like, well, we'll just see what happens. You were already resigned or resolved or whatever. Does that make any sense? It makes a lot of sense, and it really puts things in perspective. You know, I was thinking it when watching Raw, not to your specific story here, but just the safety these guys have, other than when a deranged fan hops the rail and tackles you. Like, Seth Rollins is a heel, and he's dancing and swaying, and 
having a great time going to the ring. Imagine if he had heat. <laughs> Well, I mean, they've got the big <laughs> wide entrance and, and the railings and et cetera, et cetera. But what just still amazes me to this day. And they got that. And you're right. They've got that. And now we've seen enough examples that if you want to get over that rail, you got to be quick to really stop one of these people because they're going to go for it. Yeah. And and say, again, that was what led to more people being able to do it and get away with it in the old days was you've. You were, I mean, people have, you've seen on Twitter that old picture of the Kobo Arena or the Olympic Auditorium with, with no people, just the seating set up where you had got these four foot wide aisles and, and hundreds of people on all sides of you and they're hidden and they can do it undercover. And who's to say that the hand with the knife doesn't come out right to the ribs and, and they're gone. And that's the way that shit happened then. Now there's more room, there's more railings, there's more space separating the ring, the aisleway. And nobody's trying to attack anybody for a violent, angry reason. And, you know, the the parking, I mean, and it was still at independent shows, you know, you've still got tight quarters, but is anybody trying to make a name on an independent show? Nobody's seeing those, the people that are advertised on them, nobody knows they're there. So they're trying to do these, you know, high visibility shows and get their shit in there, but that's... You know, again, that's that's the thing is that it could happen at any time because this makes no sense. And, you know, you don't know where it's coming from. But but what freaks me out the most is the fighting in the arena still. My butthole quivers every time I see baby faces, heels, anybody going over the rail out in the crowd. Because that would have <laughs> you would have literally been committing suicide in some cases if you had done that. Years ago, you would have definitely been in a, a fucking issue, possibly hand to hand, possibly somebody with a knife, possibly somebody whacking you with a chair to help the guy you're fighting. The promoter would, have, would probably be talking you out of doing it. The Well, the promoter would be firing you after you did it because there wouldn't be no talking out of. If you had told a promoter beforehand, we're going to go over the rail and fight in the crowd, he just said, well, pack your bag now because you ain't getting me sued. I'm already paying too many lawyers from all the motherfuckers jumping in the ring for you to be such an idiot that you're going to go out in their home turf. So that would have never flown if it had been told about beforehand and you would have got fired if you'd have done it afterwards if you were not in the hospital already. Because the baby face would have been fine, but the heel would have been cut. And, and, I, and still, with these guys doing this shit out in the building, some kid's going to get their teeth kicked in and then either a guy's going to retaliate or somebody's going to sue. So, but it, it still, I'm just amazed at any time that you can talk, much less they want to do it of their own idea. Any of the boys now, but any heel in general into going over the rail and out into the people, even with security following you around. I've been attacked with eight fucking police surrounding me in a flying wedge. So f fuck that. Yeah. There's three guys from Atlas security, no disrespect, but there's three guys from Atlas security and you're in the middle of fucking 2000 people in your underwear. If, if nobody hits you, that means nobody gives a shit about you. It would be interesting if these things happening in LA, the Will Smith incident, now the Chappelle incident, if it led to some sort of new law allowing entertainers to fight back as, much as they want to anyone who <laughs> attacks them in any way. That could be fun. The retaliation law. Yeah. Well, that, that'd be sort of like the Good Samaritan law they passed. It got uh, Jerry Seinfeld and his friends locked up for a year. But I'll tell you one thing, Brian. I've had a lot of close shaves in my life. But of all the close shaves that I've had, I have never enjoyed any as much as I've enjoyed the ones from the folks at Manscaped. How's that transition for you? See, now you're dealing with a professional here. Yeah, I guess so. Listeners, are you ready to be blown away? Well, I'll tell you <laughs> what. We've got big news here. Manscaped has just relaunched the Ultra Smooth Package. It's back, baby. And your package is going to be smoother than ever. Your crop is going to be tended like you've got Farmer Brown himself down there. It's your, your favorite tool and your complement 
to the Lawnmower 4.0 while keeping your boys smooth and looking and feeling and smelling their best. And especially now with Mother's Day and Father's Day coming up in quick succession. Well, you can't get to be a mother or a father with a stinky, shaggy crotch. But now you can buff, protect, and shave your most sensitive areas with, as I said, the ultra smooth package. What you do is you just grab that lawnmower 4.0 that you've already got and give them the classic trim down there. And then you take out the ultra smooth package and use the crop exfoliator infused with ingredients that can soothe, clear, and keep the skin on and around your groin. Oh, feeling refreshed. I'm so I always <laughs> want to keep the skin on on my groin <laughs> and also the skin around it is something I'd like to like to keep a hold of it at all costs as well, but it can be feeling refreshed. See, that was they put the period in the wrong place. Right. The crop exfoliator can help reduce the risk of ingrown hairs also. Because you don't want that to happen. When they grow the other way, well, they'll come out the back of your ass and they'll look shaggy. Then you've got the crop gel where you can, it's a clear shaving gel just for the groinal area so you can see where you're shaving. You don't want to obscure your view down there. There's things that could be severed if you, if you don't have a good clear view. And finally, the crop shaver designed for shaving the groin area with confidence. You know, Brian, you always need confidence when you're shaving your nuts. Because I'm telling you, anything down there, you don't want the hand shaking. You don't want to be second-guessing yourself. Things could happen. It could, my God, it could be a bloodbath. But these three precision blades in the crop shaver include extra-wide lubricating strips and a pivoting head. And we have talked about it many times, but you will not beat the pivoting head for your ultimate groin grooming experience or any groin experience that you want to have will be exacerbated and possibly masturbated with pivoting head. All kinds of baited. The crop shaver is not your average razor. It's smaller and it's thicker. That's what they say about me. Wait, it's got a micro comb bar that allows for the best shave possible from any angle. You can stand on your head you can stick a leg out the window, whatever angle you get in, you'll get the best shave possible. And all three of these things, the crop exfoliator, the crop gel, and the crop shaver are vegan, cruelty-free, and sulfate-free products. You will not get any sulfates in this razor. And, and apparently, if you cut somebody's throat with this razor, it's not considered cruel because it's cruelty-free. You have to be a vegan to use this stuff. No, the products are vegan. You don't the have to. The products are vegan and no one's going to be slicing anyone's throat with their Manscaped products. That's not how they're used and not how we're going to encourage people to use them. Well, no, there's nothing in the manual about that at all. It's just optional. It's up to you. But I, I, it go, to, go for ear to ear if you're going to do it because anything less is, is cruel. Folks, it's time to get up close and personal with the best tools for the job, the ultra smooth package from Manscaped. And right now, you can get 20% off and free shipping if you use the code DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, at manscaped.com. 20% off and free shipping with the code DRIVE at manscaped.com for the ultra smooth package or anything else that you want to use from Manscaped to smooth out your, your fellas down there. Your balls are going to thank you, and mothers will thank you, and fathers will thank you. And how, if there's a Mother's Day and a Father's Day, why is there not a children's day? And would children care if you shave your crotch? That's a question for another time. No, that's not a question for any time. Well, then maybe they just don't care. Well, speaking of things stinking around the dinner table, do you think that there was a little hint of a smell of jealousy around the dinner table at the McMahon family household that Triple H has gotten all the attention lately and poor Stephanie's been left out. So now to, in response to this, she got her own episode of evil Stephanie McMahon, WWE evil this past week on television that uh, I watched instead of NXT again, because again, they gave me nothing interesting to want to see. Brian, have you ever seen anybody? like that production team, try to stretch an hour out of a minute career in wrestling as they did with, and, and 
basically tried to present her as one of the top heels in the history of the entire wrestling promotion. Well, to be fair, I, they had several experts also say that, like some radio guys and uh, Lita. So, <laughs> and what Doctor Phil was he on this one? I forgot. I think he was in there too. Was it? We got Doctor Phil for an afternoon. Let's ask him generic questions and plug it into the entire series. What the hell? Yes, does he have he, to do he's with always any of in this? the same place. He's always in the same place. So I think just yeah, let's mention a name and get him to say something. I, I'm not knocking Stephanie when I say this that. It was obvious that they were working as hard as they could to say everything five times because she didn't have an hour documentary career in wrestling, at least not in front of the camera. She never worked anywhere for any promotion but the WWE. She never made any outside wrestling appearance. She was never really a, a wrestler, although she wrestled a couple of gimmick matches. She was never really a manager. Although she was in the corner a few times of people, she never, did she ever work a house show even for the WWE? Probably, probably. A, when things were really, really hot, probably. Possibly. But she had a, a spot that was created specifically because she was the daughter of the owner of the company. And this is, um, again, she's, She's a very good promo. The McMahon jeans, they, you know, they didn't get them from Linda, but Shane and Stephanie can both talk. And she presented herself as she was supposed to. A lot of other people couldn't have carried that off. But still, it it was what it was. The reason that she was involved was because of the evil McMahon empire and the interplay between them. If she was anybody else in the world, she wouldn't have a spot and it wouldn't have worked. And I mean, from the start of the show, they showed one picture of her with who was it? Somebody it wasn't her dance tap dancing on Andre's palm, but she said, well, I grew up at our business. No, she didn't. I'm uh, again, not knocking Stephanie. She wasn't like she was the daughter of, Anybody else in any territory, she was the daughter of Vince McMahon. The boys weren't calling her over to their knees in the locker room to tell her everything that was wrong or right with the wrestling business and where her dad was going right and where he was making mistakes and blah, blah, blah. If she grew up going to the matches at the garden or being around some of the boys at Vince's house, they were very deferential to her as the daughter of the boss. It's not like growing up in the locker room, one of the, the offspring of one of the boys. Then you get the real scoop. She went to college, and I was still there when she came out of college, and they, were, they mentioned at the start of this program she was working as an intern at the TV studio. And that was the sum total of experience of any kind that she had in the business. And it's not her fault because she was in school before. But she goes from being an intern at the TV studio to probably one of the last ideas that Shitstain had, apparently, because this happened in the summer of 99. I just left, come to OVW in Louisville. They show footage from a production meeting at some TV, because there was Kevin Dunn, there was Vince, there was the standard the crew of a production meeting at a pay-per-view or a TV taping. And she was sitting there. They had started having her come into the meetings and Triple H too. And they tried to pass it off like that was when she was first hearing that she was going to be in an angle with The Undertaker and be carried out on the cross like she was a, a prawn in the game, as they say. Does anybody legitimately believe that Stephanie, the daughter of Vince McMahon, the owner of the company, first heard that she was going to be involved in this angle at the production meeting the day of the show? Brian, answer me that. I don't understand why they would believe that. Because apparently Stephanie said that. And uh, here was a another quote from Stephanie. I don't know if this was right at this moment, but she said, that was the moment that my character realized 
God damn. She didn't even have the nerve to go to the actor's studio before she became a thespian. So they go through the whole thing where Triple H stops the wedding that she was going to have to test because he revealed that he married her in Vegas and had the video while she was Cosby in the front seat. That he, like, it's possible to marry an unconscious person. Has anybody ever been introduced into the business in worse angles? The Undertaker cross and the fucking drugged wedding and the... Uh, uh, I gotta be honest, I never saw a lot of this stuff. Because I just moved to Louisville and I was watching as little WWF as I could at that point. Because I just got out of there and I was relieved. I would watch Raw most often on Monday nights because I was working, writing Wednesday's OVW television. Thursday, when SmackDown was on, was my one day where I got away from the wrestling business, so I would tape it and tend to watch it later and usually not ever come around to it. When some of the OVW guys would be brought up to the main roster, I would watch whatever program they were on for a week or two until I got disgusted and pissed off at their way they were being presented and buried and started breaking shit, and then I quit watching it. And then Triple H fucked the dead body in the coffin. And I think I sent out a memo telling everybody in the company and OVW it was okay if they didn't watch anymore either because I didn't want them to learn any bad habits. But some of this stuff I had not seen. But it wasn't very good. And they actually called Stephanie turning on Vince one of the greatest heel turns in history. I actually had forgotten she turned on Vince at one point. They tried to make Vince the baby face. But now we find out that that is up there with Ole turning on Dusty in the cage and Zabisco stabbing Bruno in the back and Stephanie turning on Vince. Her first match got longer on the show than it lasted in the ring. She became the general manager of SmackDown. Um, they <sighs> Did she at one point get a boob job and then take him out? Did she at one point look a lot more protuberant long about the mid or late 2000s than she did before or afterwards? Or was I just imagine, it was a Was it one of those push-up bras? Well, she definitely... Got enhancement work. I think she's openly talked about that in the past. But also, I think if you look at her, she's a lot healthier looking then than at other times where she maybe got a little lean. So that may have affected things. I don't know what she's taken out of her body, but she's grown up. She's older, so she looks leaner and different. Leaner would explain it. So she, then uh, right about that. Gosh, I don't even know. The, maybe it has it on her Wikipedia. Maybe you could Google that. But when did she become head of creative? She starts interning in late 98, early 99. She does the angle there with Undertaker in the summertime of 99. I know that that's just why I moved to Louisville in July of 99. So sometime right after that. Shit stain. Then fucks everybody around and leaves with no notice and calls Vince on the phone, tell him he's done. That was September of 99. When did Stephanie become the head of creative and start hiring all the TV writers? Within a year after that? Pretty soon? I'm actually looking for uh, the exact time. I just I see a quote here that just says, Stephanie McMahon has recalled being put in charge of the WWE creative team just two weeks after initially joining the group as a writer. <laughs> McMahon had worked in various positions in WWE and is Wait, currently which the... Which ones? Yes, an intern and a person tied to a cross. That's the point. I, I've Now I've realized this show has made me realize that we got another thing to thank Shitstain for. Because when he left and went to WCW, conned them into believing that he had been responsible for the Attitude Era, left Vince high and dry. Vince brings in... A member of the family makes her head of creative and they start hiring TV writers because now he can't trust the wrestling people. So inadvertently, like he does everything else, Shitstain is responsible for TV writers getting involved in wrestling. And they did not mention on this program that Stephanie became head of creative of the biggest wrestling promotion in the world 
with two weeks experience on the creative team and two years tops experience as an intern slash person strapped to a cross slash boss's daughter. So everybody praising a strong woman in a position of power, let's be honest, no other woman in the world would have got this job because there wasn't a spot like that unless it was Vince's daughter. She did a good job of what she did, but are we expected to believe that Stephanie McMahon is one of the greatest on-camera personalities in the history of wrestling? I'm sorry. And one hour of her being put over, catered to, and doing her best Vince imitation with the characters and everything, it was long and re repetitious. And was there anything about this that drew money, or was it just a lot of TV moments with the family? No, this was horrible. And the other thing was, it went into kayfabe, and it stayed in kayfabe. It was kind of telling her story, and again, in the bullshit McMahon fashion, I grew up around wrestling, I was in the locker room, I give them credit for not including Andre the Giant being her best friend in the story here, but we saw the picture. I bet that just left the, the cutting room floor. And then all of a sudden she's on TV, and then all of a sudden that's the real person. The character does this, she does this, she does this, they never talk about the real person or anything she ever does behind the scenes ever again. That's the real interesting special. Well, I, I wish they'd kayfabe more on the guys that actually matter, but they they tell them uh, they tell every secret in the world but this they try to blur the lines of reality somehow after after stephanie was already talking about her character realized go ahead if you watch this it reveals why wwe lost so much audience after a while repeat after repeat segment after segment of stephanie cutting down top baby faces you don't see any comeback there's never like and then this person got even no there's none of that it's just her Cutting the balls off of the big show, Brian Danielson. Every single person she encountered on that thing. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people lost interest in WWE. They act like in this documentary, the authority was such an important part of the show and it became a thing and we needed that. The authority was one of the things that hurt the show. It's what ran people off. Yeah. Well, you know, what other... Entity, what other professional sports franchise, what other entertainment company, record company, movie studio, any entity, any business has for the past 25 years been presented as if the people who own it are not only evil people trying to prevent the fans of that particular organization seeing what they want to see, but they're trying to screw around all of the employees. Sooner or later, there's going to be a backlash. No pun intended with this weekend's pay-per-view. And that's what I've said a million times. Vince McMahon was one of the premier heels and television personas in the history of wrestling. And when that had run its course, somebody should have corrected that course. The sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and offspring and multi-generational McMahons didn't all need to follow in evil footsteps. Then it turned people against the promotion itself, which is why that suddenly AEW three years ago became the biggest crowdfunding project in the history of wrestling, where all the people started buying tickets even if they couldn't go to the show because they wanted to take up for the wrestlers that had been screwed around by the evil McMahons. So the McMahon family created the demand and fulfillment of their own competition by disgruntling the people that have been watching them for years by giving them shit and trying to make them like it. <sighs> Every time I go over here to uh, Kroger and go shopping, I want to know that the guy running that place hates all of his customers and wants to screw all of his employees. That's the place I want to shop. That was the thing. It went into kayfabe, and then they pretended like the authority era was some golden period, as opposed to the period where they ran people off, where the show became unwatchable. And WWE has never addressed their role in what independent wrestling is now, which is less about being an independent wrestling promotion and more like up yours than WWE. Yeah. <laughs> 
let let the people that are most devoted to wrestling want to band together and support anything besides the biggest wrestling company. Hmm. But you know what? At least on the other channel, on one of the big networks, we have a a highly rated program about a wrestler, and we actually even see him wrestling sometimes. It's just that it's not a wrestling show. But more people are watching that than any of the wrestling shows. As a matter of fact, I heard Young Rock is NBC's highest rated comedy. And that both shows you how little appeal that wrestling has these days that shows about the childhood of a famous wrestler get better ratings than wrestling shows. And it shows you how fucking far the networks have fallen. That this is now I love Lucy, MASH, Seinfeld, Young Rock. Which isn't funny at all and is not entertaining at all. It's a horrible show. Actually, this one was funny this last week. It was fucking hilarious. There's a reason they've chased people off the cable. It's because network comedy is the lamest shit. And if they call this a comedy, I don't know what it is. It's not really a drama. It's not really a comedy. But it's pure suck. A and dramedy. it's an awful show. A dramedy. That's what they call the things. They can't figure out what they're doing, and they try to make them everything. But this this episode this week was hilarious. You just had to, you didn't even have to turn the sound up because I'll just, this episode covered his first match in Corpus Christi, Texas. I was there. So on this one, I can speak firsthand. Colt Cabana played Steve Lombardi, the Brooklyn brawler. And he actually didn't look too far off from what Lombardi looked like back in those days. So that, believe it or not, Colt Cabana was the star of this show. He was the best actor and looked the most like the person he was portraying. And that was the last time we're going to see Colt Cabana on TV for the rest of the year. Well, because he's the Brooklyn brawler, and I don't think brawler figures in too much more. Well, also because it's the first time we've seen Colt Cabana on TV all year. Does anyone use him on TV? <laughs> oh, you mean the other TV show? No, I think he just, he gets Tony's check, but I don't think he needs to show up anymore or anything. But anyway, that's where the, the string of, of winners ended. Brian, you got to go back just to see the facsimiles that they came up with for everybody. Now, first of all, the brawler picked Rock up at the airport, which he did, and he was his opponent that night also, which he was, and they get to the building, and I don't know, I don't know what building they shot, but it wasn't the old Coliseum of Corpus Christi because <laughs> I've worked that building for World Class. I worked that building for Crockett. That was the Clash of Champions where Moscarus worked with Cactus Jack. Um, and I was there on this particular night. And that wasn't the old Corpus Christi Coliseum. And they said, oh, it's sold out 15,000 fans for Rock's, you know, Rock's first match. The whole story was he was nervous because the first match ever in front of people on a WWF show in front of 15,000 people. It was sold out that night, but the old Coliseum Corpus Christi only seated about 6,000, give or take. So that's what it was. And I got to be honest with you, I always liked working that building and working Corpus Christi because it's a fucking pain in the ass to get there. Even if you live in Dallas, it's almost 500 miles to Corpus Christi. You got to fly from almost anywhere. But once you get there, it's beautiful. It's on the ocean. Not only is the Coliseum right across the street from the ocean, but also like four blocks down was the Holiday Inn. All the boys stayed. They had incredible room service with seafood. And once you got there, you could like relax and have a nice, decent meal, a nice room. All the girls knew where the hotel was, and you're just four blocks down from the building. So that was good. Back to Rock's first night. Michael Hayes, I swear to God, I, I wish we had a Stephen P. New spot because this would call for it. Michael Hayes, if he still had the gumption of a free bird, would either sue or physically attack the motherfucker that they claimed was him. Not only was he using a horribly exaggerated Southern accent, something that 
It, I mean, it was more South Carolina than Pensacola, but it's something that somebody without a Southern accent would make up as a Southern accent. And he was five foot six. He just looked like some little short dumpy fuck. And and they called him Michael Hayes. The Iron Sheik came in. I don't know who he is, but he was dressed better than the real one. He had a beautiful, spotless, immaculate suit and all this jewelry. <laughs> the real Sheik would come in with that shit that had been down the road for a year or two. Steve Austin is played by Luke Hawks. You've heard of him. He's a guy in Louisiana that also does stunt work in the movies, and he's a wrestler. And I gotta, I gotta give him something. He looks absolutely nothing like Steve Austin did or does, but he talked just like him. He put the work in. Sounded if you closed your eyes, you could hear Austin's cadence. Triple H. You've had to have seen a picture of the Triple H. They put it out on Twitter. Yeah, I saw a picture of like a locker room scene with various people. There were a few I couldn't figure out who the hell they were. Yeah. Well, Triple H looked like a cover of a crossover magazine where Blue Boy met Fox Hunting Weekly. And I started to realize then why the guy they got to, as Mick Foley, he didn't look too bad because between the long hair and the mask, you can't really see him, right? Because he was mankind then. Um. The Undertaker looked like one of those United Kingdom tribute tour ripoff poster Undertakers, right? Like he's fucking 6'2 and emaciated, but he's got long hair and a hat. And it, Bruce Pritchard was a character on the show at Gorilla Position, and they didn't even try. They just hired some fucking guy and called him Bruce Pritchard. Not even if anything remotely looking like him, same color hair, any kind of dress manner of speed they just found some guy doing valet parking said you're bruce pritchard you see that wwe evil thing bruce pritchard looks like calvert de forest lately well he this larry guy, bud melman th yes say i know who larry bud melman was calvert de forest david letterman's most entertaining fucking recurring regular for many years until he couldn't leave and go to cbs and to yeah. keep the name other than chris elliott yes well i still liked larry bud uh, but the point is, I realized watching this show why that not everybody can be a big wrestling star. Because every once in a while, they'll find one. They found a guy that looked kind of like Bam Bam Bigelow, right? And the guy that they've got playing young rock around the era of his first match ain't too far off. But most of these guys, you can't find people that look like any of these guys. That's why they were stars, because they didn't look like everybody else. They didn't look like normal people. And it's it's just so awkward recreating that. Not only just, I mean, this is not just because I know these people in real life, as they say. This is because everybody knows what these people look like that are watching this show. And it's got to be, what the fuck? It, it takes your mind off the the story they're trying to tell you when you're sitting there going, that's not Triple H. This guy's head was the size of Triple H's nose. In other words, he had a normal-sized human head. Oh, I thought you meant he had a big head. No. He had a normal, the whole head was as big as Triple H's nose. Oh. Triple H's head is as big as this whole guy. And then the only thing about the the actual match is... They presented it as if the people were just hostile to, to rock and didn't care and were sitting there. And then suddenly, because he sold Brawler's chin lock and got him into it, then they cheered him for his comeback. It, this was not, the people who knew, knew. We knew he was going to be something. I, I was impressed by this, but then the time that I called Vince on the phone and said, hey, he's going to be your champion in five years, was after the first time after this that I saw him work out with Dr. Tom and some of the other guys in the at the studio when we could talk and I could see a little more. I, you know, But we knew that he had the size and the athletic ability and the genealogy, and he did a good job here. He was very advanced for a guy who had never had a match in front of people, but it was a regular dark match in Corpus Christi, Texas. It was babyface versus heel. The people booed the Brooklyn brawler. 
and they cheered the guy that was wrestling the Brooklyn Brawler. Not like Steve Austin or The Rock, but they cheered him like a, like they cheered all the baby faces back then that were wrestling the heels. And because it was the first match of the night, it's not like they had been worn the fuck out. So the match was fine. It wasn't earth shaking. You could see that he was special or going to be special, but there wasn't some aha moment where the people suddenly went from, we don't want to see you at all to tearing the house down. It was nice cheers. But that was the episode of Young, Young Rock this week. Aren't you sorry you missed it? Like I said, there's a reason why people don't watch network TV anymore. There's a reason why kids don't watch TV at all. There's nothing to watch. If there was a show that was hip that captured an audience, there'd be some buzz about it. There's never any buzz about Young Rock. It's a terrible show. It's lame. It's not funny. It's not entertaining. Historically inaccurate in miraculous ways at times. Just a waste of time. Okay, maybe you might know this because there's one. there was one hilarious thing that would actually probably only be hilarious to me, you, and possibly the listeners of this program. There's Rock sitting down talking to Austin, and they had their initial meeting and conversation, and somehow, I can't remember, but somehow it comes up, whatever somebody else was wearing, the outfit, the gimmick, outlandish, whatever, and Austin said, you think that's bad? Look at that guy. And then they pan over, and there's Mantar with the bison head on trying to figure out how to get in the door. And he can't get in the door. He's trying to turn sideways, bonk. And he's trying to turn this way, bonk. And he's trying to bend over, bonk. And that was, to me, that was kind of funny. But the only problem I'm thinking is, in February of 96, was Mantar still even there? Or did they just decide to put that in as a sight gag? In February of 96 for the dark match. I don't remember if he was still there or not. Well, in February 96, that's when Rock had his dark match in Corpus Christi. I believe it was February, wasn't it? But Mantar, because I was not on the creative team that infamous night that I managed Mantar, because I didn't know about it until 30 minutes beforehand, and Bruce was ribbing me. Probably see if I'd walk out or go along with it. I should have walked out. It saved me a lot of grief later in life. But that was in 95. And Mantor didn't last that long. How long did Mantor last? I don't know. I can't remember more than three matches. And the one I was at ringside for and two others that I unfortunately witnessed. Anyway, well, somebody out there in the, in the audience can do that research. Was Mantor in Corpus Christi that night? so that Austin could point out to the young rock that he couldn't get his fat head in the fucking door. What else we got? Young rock. We, I think you've made your feelings on young rock abundantly clear. And I, the problem is the name rock. You've got man mountain rock. You got kid rock. You got young rock. You know the big star when it comes to the Rock family, don't you? You even got the Rock and Roll Express, but I'm talking the big name, the big name Brian and the Rock family. You talking about RockAuto.com? Well, I was thinking you might say Danny Garcia, and then I'd say no, it's RockAuto.com, but you beat me to it, so that's what I'll say. I go to RockAuto.com all the time to see pictures of the Rock giving auto to people. Giving auto to people? Giving Is that like auto. giving head to people? That's what I call it now. The Rock gives auto. He gives... He gives good auto. Downtown Bruno gets auto. <laughs> Haku gets auto. <laughs> Whenever there's a cameraman, there's a car to be given out. Well, but now is it which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is the cameraman there to record the, the truck being given out or is the truck there just for the cameraman? I feel like The Rock's kind of like a Dallas page with a budget. He always has a camera guy ready to go and film something. <laughs> Hey, Mom, come here. I got a truck. And she said, wait, let me fix my hair. Anyway, folks, if you'd like a car or truck that runs and you have one that doesn't or is about to peter out, and after all, it's always better to peter in than peter out, well, you got to go to rockauto.com to get the lowest prices on the latest parts from the newest models. And that's what rockauto.com does. Why would you choose to spend 30%, 50%, 100% or more for the exact same auto parts at a chain store or new car dealership than you will at rockauto.com? 
Why would you do that? Because you're a blithering fucking simpleton. That's why. That's the only reason I can come up with. Because normal people would choose to pay less for the same part. And that's what you're going to get here at rockauto.com. They've got everything for your car, truck, boat, plane, train, sled, or other motorized conveyance. Don't even get me started on the tricycles, the unicycles, the bicycles, and all the other cycles that they've got. Your monthly cycle. They've got parts that will fit everything, even in such a constricted location as that. Folks, whether it's for your classic car or your daily driver, You'll get everything you need in a few easy clicks. It will be delivered to your door because the rockauto.com catalog is unique and remarkably easy to navigate. You just sit right down on that catalog. You put up the sale. You start the engine. And you navigate that thing right through the treacherous waters of crooked auto parts dealers onto the island of accomplishment after you have got your part and you put it in and your car didn't blow up, and it runs, try not to run over anybody or potentially run off the road and need more parts. I don't know where I'm going with this, so I'll go back to rockauto.com. All the parts your car will ever need at reliably low prices and an amazing selection. Write JCE in their How Did You Hear About Us box on their aforementioned website, and they will know that we sent you and then we will be suitably rewarded. You will get nothing. That's JCE in the How Did You Hear About Us box. RockAuto.com. All the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto. Boop. Dot com. Dot com. What was the point? Well, they don't say it all the time. It's on the commercial. All the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto. Boop. Dot com. Well, there's a dot com on there, but you don't have to sing it every single time. I like my commercial singing. All right. All righty. What else we got here? Do we watch Raw this week? Did you watch Raw? <sighs> you know, I did one of my fast forward watches where I tried to catch the main things and... There were no main thing. There's like a commercial break every time there's a commercial break. And then they come back and they send someone to the ring. And by the time they get to the ring, there's <laughs> another commercial break, a review package... For no good reason, another review package and then another commercial. Not even in involving people that are in the ring or currently <laughs> making their way to the ring. Yeah. They'll come back from a commercial. You'll go, well, where's George? George was almost to the ring. They're talking about Bill, John, and Ted. And then George is in the ring. Such a weird show. It really is. <laughs> the, the sad thing is they painstakingly go to a lot of trouble to format it like that. So they do that on purpose. It's it's like you can understand somebody driving too fast, slick conditions, slides off the road, ends up wrapped around a tree. That happens in the twinkling of an eye, and you didn't really try to. It just ended up that way. But no, they work at this. So this was May second, and I have actually I have some notes in my in my uh, observations here that will bear out what you said. But the first segment was a package on the interaction between the Bloodline and RK Bro and Drew McIntyre from last week, because that's apparently the six-man tag main event that we are being uh, exposed to this weekend on the pay-per-view. Instead of that unification match we were going to get. Yeah, well, and I guess they had to kick it up a notch, spice it up a little. But then here comes Roman Reigns, Paul Heyman, and the Usos. Never going to argue about that. But it was seven minutes into the show before Paul Heyman spoke his first word. We got a package, we got an entrance in seven minutes. And then he gives Roman Reigns the big introduction. And Paul hands the microphone to Reigns and he asks the people to acknowledge him. And as soon as he does that, RK Bro appear in the ring out of nowhere and hit stereo RKOs on each one of the Usos. And each one of the Usos just takes a bump and rolls out and completely fucking disappears. It's like they went under the ring. I try to find these people. Every time somebody disappears in the middle of something like this now, I'm trying to find them. And you can't see them in a camera shot. They must have a, a bunker that they roll into under the ring. 
And then once they disappeared, then the music hits, and here comes Drew McIntyre. And Roman Reigns goes nowhere, and Randy Orton and Riddle are in the ring standing there with him doing nothing. And Drew McIntyre steps in the ring, and then both Orton and Riddle step out to the floor, and the Usos are still gone, so now Drew and Roman can have their, it's their scene now. They are literally laying this shit out like like a play where the actor playing the butler brings the fucking Brandy in and then goes off stage until his next scene. I wish they would bring Brandy in. Oh, God. And then Roman and McIntyre have the big fight, and then suddenly the Usos come back when Drew's getting the upper hand, but then suddenly RK Bro comes back in, and now they all have a big pull apart with that shitty camera work where you can't even tell what the fuck's going on. And they go to the break. It took 15 minutes for that to fucking happen. And the, the, it's so distracting when I know I can't be the only person that is sitting there wondering where all these people that were there a second ago just fucking went to instead of watching what they want me to watch that's happening on the screen because there's all these odd questions that would come up to a normal person with a functioning brain. Am I the only one? No, you're right. Everyone waits at stage left for their moment to run on and do their cartwheel and return to the stage. That's ridiculous. This segment, you said, you said it took forever. You know, the main event, I'm not even going to get into the merits of the main event or anything else, (laughs) but the main event, a six woman tag match, they were like going to it almost with a half hour left in the show. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe they're going to give it this much time. I've got specific notes. It didn't get that much time. <laughs> By the Certainly time they actually not. had the match, it had nowhere near that much time. Anything that happens on this program takes for fucking ever. Again, there's, there's not any ridiculously not suitable for television talent on the program, maybe almost. And they don't do any ridiculous, risky, stupid shit that you go, what is the matter with these people? So there's more professionalism, but it's just boring. And some of it's the talent's fault, and some of it's not the talent's fault. And some of it is is both, to be honest. The next match after that incident was Kevin Owens teaming with Otis and Gable against the Street Prophets and Ezekiel. I think Elias and Ezekiel, I think that's the the best way to put it together, Ezekiel. And that went for, it's the same thing. How did Owens, who was supposed to be a main event guy, suddenly get, you know, stuck into, shoehorned into this business with these idiots? You know, it was the promo backstage with all these guys, and Owens, and especially Gable. And I realize why I don't like this show. It's it's like theater camp for adults. Because no adult acts like this. I don't know adults who really want to see other adults act like children. And you watch the way they're behaving. You know they're encouraged to get even hokier and stupider. And then they have the match. Who cares about the match? Who cares about the feud? Who cares about any yeah. of this? The only thing I'll say of note, they put tassels on Ezekiel's arms. If face paint is next, I'm all for this. I don't see where we're going to go. <laughs> He's going to look more like the renegade than the warrior, though. Uh, so AJ Styles did a promo, and they've added a stipulation for tonight. If he beats Damian Priest, then Damian Priest is going to be barred from ringside with Edge on Sunday. But if he doesn't beat him, then nothing's going to change. Oh. And even if he beats him, nothing will change. Nothing will back, change. Yeah. Nothing will change. Not a lot's going to change. Um, everyone will be happy to know under the fairness in the workplace doctrine that the WWE is still investigating Cruella DeVille's conduct. <laughs> she has been a representative of the WWE office for months on television, and for months she has been making biased rulings, picking favorites, fucking around Naomi in particular, and other babyfaces, and they're still investigating. 
I mean, the only case I can think of where the evidence was any clearer was January 6th, and there's a lot of witnesses to fucking speak to in that one. I don't think this one should take that long. But tonight, she's got to wrestle as a wrestler, not an official. She has no official powers. That's what Adam Pierce is telling her while this in- investigation is going on. You know what? I had watched the evil Stephanie McMahon documentary before I watched Raw, and it hit me just... They're still doing it. Just a week, not even week. I shouldn't say week, but the evil authority figure for no good reason. The yeah. rest of this show sucks on its own fine enough. You don't need to add a bad authority figure. And uh, Cruella's got, she's got a great look and she can talk. I haven't seen anything that makes me think that her wrestling is equal to Mildred Burks, but you know, but this is just, nobody cares because it's just obviously fake. Because this would not transpire like this. Beer Mahan claimed another victim. They actually interviewed his opponent, Bert Hansen from Greensboro, who used to work down the street at a barbecue place. And tonight his dream comes true. But unfortunately, our nightmares came true as well. We had to see Beer Mahan again. And then we get to the meat of the matter, a blackout, and here comes the House of Edge. And <laughs> for whatever reason, the WWE can outfit these guys in spooky clothing and give them a dark, spooky entrance that doesn't require 30 or 40 second stretches of the lights being off because they can't figure out how to get from one place to another and be in this position they're supposed to be in like the folks over at the House of Black over on AEW. So they got to be pissed. Malachi Black has to be pissed off. He's got the fucking other numb nuts and some reject named Buddy and his group and they've been stinking the joint out with every single spooky thing they try to do and nobody gives a shit and it's Believe me, when we get to AEW, the the death, the last rites were given to the House of Black this past Wednesday night. And here comes Edge and Damian Priest, and they're doing it just fine. And uh, Edge's promo, I know you got all over Edge last week. Did you list this promo? And you can, uh, can you honestly tell me that you didn't enjoy this. He's got delivery. He's got emotion. He didn't give them, the fans a place to what him. He shut that down. He antagonized people and told the story and didn't stutter in him and Hall. I like it better than the House of Black. I'll give you that. I like that they're using Damian Priest in some sort of meaningful way. But I'm sorry. It's, it's, it, to me, this is like a guy that was sitting at catering like, I need to do something else. What can I do? How about I just become evil for no good reason? And I'll have control of the lights like every good evil person in wrestling. I don't know. It came across to me like theatrical. This is, again, with WWE, and I'm going to give Cody credit because even with his pretentious way of speaking, he actually comes across more real than most of these other guys. (laughs) Everything they say just is so unbelievable and silly, it comes across like they're delivering a speech. So was Edge okay here? Yeah, for Sci-Fi Network or something. But I don't like this. I didn't like it at all, actually. Well, I didn't say the creative that caused him to lose his mind after he and his wife were the beloved uh, legendary figures in the mixed tag was necessarily good, but he's doing a good job with what they've got him doing. But the music interrupted, and there came AJ, and they went to the match. And this is the biggest problem with Raw. Between the monolithic monologues and soliloquies and the interminable entrances and the attention on everything else but the matches even when they try to have a match nobody cares the people in the building aren't really up for it it doesn't come across on television like a big event because everybody knows they're either going to go two minutes go to a break and come back and do another two minutes or there's going to be some screwy flat finish out of nowhere whatever the case they have really they've hurt themselves badly Because people don't look forward to the matches. And that's the fucking show. And even the breaks. They go to the breaks. It's not like they say, Oh my God, this action's amazing. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. It's like a weird, like, Oh my God, and he's on the floor. 
And th- yeah. they just cut. They went to commercial. What and was that? And then they fade to black, and you think, is the show <laughs> over? If you don't have a clock, you're like, it's fucking 11 o'clock? I don't know. Anyway, the, it, this match, they had a fight at first. They kept it moving. It was nothing great. They took a kind of a weird bump over the top, and AJ did a dive, and they fought on floor and went to the break. And then they came back and had, and that's why I'm wondering, is it the WWE presentation? Is it a style clash between these two guys? It didn't come together. And watching AEW and WWE back to back, also the WWE ring is so muffled, so quiet, diminishes all the bumps. You don't hear guys running. That's a Kevin Dunn from his lips to mine. The ring's too loud. You fucking little rodent. Anyway. It didn't come together. It wouldn't matter how loud the ring was. They're going to still pipe in as much noise as they want. Well, but it's all the wrong noise. Um, It got better towards the finish, but then they had a lousy finish. Edge distracted AJ, but he still rolled Priest up (laughs) one, two, three. And then the heels jumped in and got a little heat on him and threw two chairs in like they were going to go for his arm. And here comes Balor and his music, and he made the save. And they left, no contact. <sighs> but that was a match. Um, Miz TV, is that on every single fucking week? I didn't think so, but since you had us watching Raw, it seems like it's on every single week. Every week, Miz TV, and it takes him forever to even get his guest out. And in this case, it was Mustafa Ali. And I've made a note that I would rather watch Judge Judy interview Tim Horner and started fast forwarding, but then I see Austin Theory. So, okay, let's see what, and Austin basically, (laughs) he offered Mustafa Ali a championship contenders match because Vince won't let him say non-title match. Have we mentioned that? That's another thing. Oh, I didn't realize that's, Exactly no, what that was. That's a, a non-title match is a championship contenders match. Because Vince, and I, I heard him say this myself 20-something years ago, he feels like it has a negative connotation. Like non-title match means non-important match or non-good match. So He's so simple. He's just such a simple... I know, but instead of saying, hey, you get a non-title match, if you can beat me without the title on the line, then I'll put the title on the line, but you got to prove yourself. No, you get a championship contender's opportunity. But that is another Vince-ism. Can't say non-title match. And then they made it a handicap match. So Miz and Theory wrestled Mustafa Ali, and surprise, surprise, they beat him. So now they're trying to push this weasel and they're beating him in like in some far off galaxy that they got their logic from. This will get this guy over. Next level booking. We just can't see it. If you've got an underneath baby face that the people really organically have started liking and taking to then you do stuff like beating him in a handicap match two against one. You don't give him a fair shot or you do the, this. But just a guy that you brought back that nobody's seen in months and nobody really gives a shit about. And you just beat him the first time they see him. You just beat him. He's a loser. Next. Speaking of next. Our truth Dana, Reggie, Tamina, Tazawa, the 24-7 title, more bullshit backstage, everybody acting like complete idiots. Suddenly, in the middle of their arguing about their wedding or whatever the fuck, Nikki ass runs up and wins the 24-7 title and runs out the back door with the referee and... I basically jotted down that everybody involved in this segment should have been fired twice. They should be fired for doing it. Then they should be hired back and then fired again because one firing was not enough to register the point that all of them suck. And then everybody that tried to contribute to this as a producer or writer should also be fired. And then we should get a large meat grinder 
pour everybody in the top of it, twist it, and make burgers out of the residue. Otherwise, Ned, I didn't like it much. All right, another brick in the wall. And then, for the 24-7 title, some way or another, they had another match immediately following this malarkey, which I did not watch. Because at that point, I wrote, how the fuck are two million people watching this show? Are they the bots? Are there really two million functioning, living, breathing human beings with thoughts and dreams and aspirations like the rest of us in this little small hick town? Are they really watching this show? And if so, why? I know why we're watching it. <laughs> and it's tough to make it through. So the question is, how many people are really watching it? And the other thing is, I can't imagine how many people could make it through all three hours of this crap. It's a long show. It feels much longer than three hours. We're not done yet. Um, Seth Rollins came to the ring, dancing and prancing and romancing. I'm I'm thinking now, do they just run the same show every week? I would, except for Seth's outfits being completely different colors. I can't really tell the difference. And last week they celebrated Orton's 20th anniversary. So now Seth wanted his appreciation night. Everybody wants to be appreciated. Jericho wants to be appreciated. Seth wants to be appreciated. I'd appreciate it if they'd stop appreciating everybody. So he stood in the spotlight. He let the fans ooh at him. He said nothing of interest and then introduced a highlight reel of himself. But instead, Cody music interrupts and here's what you were talking about cody comes out and uh, at least he's natural with it with his rehearsal you can tell he's rehearsed just like you said his prepared remarks but it flows better from him than almost anybody else so he does deliver it with conviction but it still goes on forever, although I did like him saying that Seth was dressed in a hideous Johnny Polo getup. But this went a while. And then finally, Seth insulted Dusty, said he was an egomaniac, and he wasn't good enough to be the WWF champion, and Cody isn't either. And I thought, okay, here we go. Now there's the, well, you've gone too far now, you son of a bitch moment, and we're going to see something. And they had a fight for about 20 seconds. And then Cody, dressed in a suit and alligator dress shoes, in the middle of a hockey fight with Seth Rollins, turned around, ran to the ropes, jumped up, and gave him a Cody cutter. Out of When's the last time you saw a Cody cutter in a street fight? Out of nowhere. And Seth rolled out. So we had a 10-minute promo and 30 seconds of action, and it's over with. And they'll fight again this weekend on the pay-per-view after they've had three weeks of face-to-face -face interviews where they've had every chance in the world to kick the shit out of each other. And I'm not saying they should kick the shit out of each other before the pay-per-view. I'm saying if they stand in the ring next to each other, all alone, just the two of them. Just the two of us. We look for love, no time for tears, wasted waters, all that is, and it don't make those flowers grow. Just the two of them. And they haven't fought meaningfully by now. <laughs> Why do we think they're going to tear each other limb from limb on Sunday? They've just been talking to each other for weeks. He didn't tear him limb for limb for what he said about his dad. That's the thing. As soon yeah. as the baby face hears him say something about his dad, he has to pop him. He didn't even hit him first. I think Rollins hit him first. I believe he did. But he didn't hit him often. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> Just the two of us. We can make it if we try. Just the two of us. Just the Just two, the two of, of us. us. Thank you. Uh, all righty, <laughs> next. <laughs> so Cedric Alexander 
asked MVP for a chance at redemption by fucking with Bobby Lashley, messing Bobby Lashley around, Cedric calling back to the days of the Hurt Business. We had everything together if it wasn't for that no good Lashley. So basically they've booked this match and at the bell, MVP and almost start coming out, but Cedric jumps Lashley from behind when he's distracted by the music of their entrance, and MVP is talking on the microphone while they're walking down to the ring, while Cedric has jumped Lashley from behind, and the point is, everybody's listening, and everybody's staring at almost, and no, there was no reaction to the heat, to the attack. It was killing the response. I don't know why they put this together like this, where just as they're just about to go at it, the music interrupts and then they've got MVP talking while there's action going on in the ring and splitting everybody's attention and blah, blah, blah. But then Lashley for being jumped from behind, then moments later shoved Cedric off and then got knocked out on the floor. And then poor Cedric did a dive, but caught his feet on the ropes and landed right at Lashley's feet. And they tried to play it off that, Lashley stopped his forward momentum. Lashley put his hands up to catch the motherfucker, and the motherfucker didn't make it to him. It was like he was on a string. He just went far enough out that his feet caught and then straight down. So then Lashley makes a comeback on the floor, throws him in the ring, spears him, and hurt locks him, and it's over. But it was just, it was dreary. Nobody cares almost as a lost cause, I think, at this point, especially after he lost the arm wrestling and the two-minute match. The creative is not helping. MVP and Lashley together was a fucking money-drawing bit of business. I don't know what they've done here. Do you? No. No. <laughs> no how long until they release cedric i thought they already had we hadn't seen him in months we hadn't seen him in a while and then they use him like this I, you know there's a lot of questions with no answers but i do have answers for one of your questions the question or not even the question but the statement that you started to make earlier i have exact times on this because they recapped rhea ripley turning on Liv Morgan. And then they had a backstage interview where Liv recited a memorized, prepared statement, much as you would when you've been accused of a crime or you're entering your plea in court. And the entrances for the six-girl tag main event started at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. At 10.30, the six-girl tag entrances start. The bell rings to start the six-girl tag. At 10.44. Wow. Wow. They figured out some way to get 14 minutes out of entrances, commercial breaks, and a couple of unrelated packages. And then we had Rhea Ripley, Becky Lynch, and Cruella DeVille against Liv Morgan, Bianca Belair, and Oscar. And I liked half this match. Actually, I liked three and a half parts of this match. Rhea Ripley has the size, the attitude, the personality. She works like a man, which is the ultimate compliment that any of the girls in the business are, are ever given. Well, I don't know about now. They probably get mad. But in the histor historical wrestling business, when you told one of the girls she worked like a guy, that was the ultimate compliment. And Ripley does. It's almost impossible for most girls, partially because the way they're put together. But she's got it. The size, the reach, the body language, the facials, the attitude, everything. Bianca Belair is much better than she should be for her level of experience because she's not been in the business that long. And now that I've seen her a couple times against some of the few other really talented women, I'm a fan of Bianca Belair, except for the, she'd be happy going to a, her fucking dog's funeral. 
That's the only complaint I got. I wish you would s skip and happy a little less in certain situations. Becky Lynch, like you said, is a star. She can work. She can talk. She's a heel. She's a personality. Cruella, I mentioned, has a great look. Jury is out on her work, so I like half of her. Liv and Oscar cluttered this fucking thing up for me. Just so you know. Well, I know but your it, problems with Oscar because you've gone into them in the past. What was the problem specifically with Liv Morgan here in this match? I don't, she just, she's small. She's obviously she can't talk because she just does the memorized shit. She looks like one of those girls that's too purdy and too small. And I don't buy her at the level I do the other girls because she doesn't convince me. And, you know, she looks like the kind of the lingerie models that Johnny Ace was trying to hire. But, and Oscar, I mean, let's face it, I mean, come on. I'm racist because I don't like outlaw mud show indie Japanese talent that can't wrestle. But yet a major publicly traded corporation is making that girl act like that on television. And that's not racist. Bullshit. Just so everybody's clear. But in this match, the people cared. The work didn't suck. There are some stars in it. And even what we saw was the best match of the show. And Rhea and Bianca were good together. I'd like to see a singles match. Pretty much otherwise than that, the Oscar especially screaming and there was some sloppiness with Liv and Oscar and Cruella. And then at the finish, everybody did anything to ever did anything. Everybody did everything to everybody. And then everybody disappeared and went to the bunker under the ring again, except for DeVille and Liv Morgan. And they did some stuff. And then Bianca distracted Cruella and Liv beat her. And that was the end of that. And by the way, did your... I saw the one, the finish, the literal exact moment that the finish happened and my DVR froze. Were they about to go over time or what happened afterwards? Did you see Oh, I'm not that? sure. No, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually thought Sonya Deville was the one who seemed offbeat with everyone else. I apologize for any noise. They're doing some construction here in the house. But I What is that, a jackhammer? It's not a jackhammer, but what I was saying is... A genetic jackhammer? You got four kids. I thought it was Sonya Deville that was the problem in the match more than Liv Morgan or Asuka. Well, I didn't say she could work. I said the jury's out on that. I like the way she looks, but and she can talk, but it, it, was, it, was, it was some clutter in there. But again, if you can't find six to be in the main event on Raw, for where's Freddie Prinze going to find a whole roster of them? Hey, I got to tell you, though, Becky Lynch, like I said before, I can't take my eyes off her. Everything she does, she's so invested in that it's like the best kind of wrestler. I want to see everything she does from the moment she starts talking, although sometimes it's a little too rehearsed, but she does better with it. It's like her and Cody are the two best, maybe. And then she, her in the ring, just from the moment she walks down there, everything she does, she's one of the very, very best. She's really, really good. Can't take my eyes off of you. You'd feel like heaven to touch. I was I'm talking about the way she carries herself so in the much. ring, not the fucking Frankie Valley. You're just my too eyes good off you. to be true. What's too good to be true over on the Arcadian Vanguard Network this week? Oh, How's really? That one? Right now, when they're banging right above my fucking yeah, head? That, yeah, get it, give us some banging news on all your various programming this week. Another banging week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at Facebook.com. Slash super, slash super podcast. I'm debating whether I should yell and just be a preemptive strike. <laughs> you sound like Robin Leach on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. I'm screaming and I don't know why. You know, people last week when we had I had the gravel trucks over here, they said, God damn, that Arcadian Vanguard editing team sure does a good job because Jim and Brian are both screaming and we can't hear shit. Oh, I don't think there's any editing around this noise here today, but... Back to the plug. This week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, on Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon at suawpod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, Brian's guest is Stephen Bell, author of Dynamite and Davey, 
The Explosive Lives of the British Bulldogs, a brand new book. Hear that interview today at suawpod.com or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention of the latest Patriot episode for Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry patrons. A very special one where the boys talk with Bobby Reynolds, who runs the Facebook group. Whatever happened to your favorite porn star? Hear what? that today. Wait a minute. I've got a list of people I've been looking for. Well, then you may need to hear this episode of the special Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry interview on porn. Hear it today. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this plug. Patreon.com slash Baldrin and Barry. Of course, you can hear Breaking Kayfabe wherever you find your favorite podcast or go to BaldrinPod.com. There's Whatever also- happened to Serena? Serena. Serena. She was a big star. I don't know. I just saw that uh, Tashin Books is putting out. I couldn't believe it when I came in the uh, Tashin catalog. Like a deluxe Vanessa Del Rio book. Just filled with the filthiest photos ever. Well, I in a very even, tasteful even, manner. Tashin. It even comes with its own asshole. Once again, patriot.com slash Baldrin and Barry. <laughs> or go to baldrinpod.com and you can actually click a link to take you right to the Patreon page. Also, can you look- click a link to take you right to the asshole? You may just have to make a phone call. I'm not exactly sure how up on on technology they are, Vanessa Del Rio. I don't know why we're talking. How up the ass they are on this thing. (laughs) Well, to move on with the plug, want to make mention, for those of you Mid-South Wrestling fans, I now have for sale original 1984 Mid-South Wrestling calendars. These are off the press. They were in a box for 40, almost 40 years. Of course, now that Arcadian Vanguard owns the assets of Pro Wrestling Enterprises, we have this. These are original. If it is something you are interested in, go look for my Twitter page. I'm at GreatBrianLast on Twitter, or of course, tinyurl.com slash superpodstore to pick up your copy today. Or if you want to go over to the Home Depot in Teterboro, he'll be selling some out of the trunk of his car at 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. Oh, will you stop? And you know, I don't fuck around with Teterboro anymore. And of course, the That's 60- right, you stay in Secaucus. The 605 Super Podcast Fuck Secaucus, the membership! Boy, what do the people doing construction think now? Go through yeah. the archive today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast. I hope they're not listeners. The Mothership. I hope they're not listening. I hope they're doing the work they're supposed to be doing. Can you hear this noise? Tell me, can you hear this? Well, I thought that was you just wiggling around and farting and shit. No, that's not me wiggling around. It's the construction people. Oh, for around. heaven's sake. Well, it sounds like you've got somebody trapped in your wall inside the wall is that what you've are you finally letting that guy out that tried to crawl in through the crawl space and got stuck behind your wall jesus christ what the the fuck are they doing (laughs) he he don't want to come out all right don't don't worry folks j sharknado will take (laughs) care of all of that you'll never hear a thing (laughs) well i will see your construction and raise you a thunderstorm that could be on my end here in a second it's looking very foreboding but it's, it's it's perfect timing as a matter of fact a dark cloudy sky something wicked this way comes as we talk about last week's or this week's aw dynamite program on may the 4th may the 4th be with you you know i did something wrong this week normally because raw comes first in the week I watch Raw first, and then nothing live, obviously. You can't fast forward. But I watch Raw first, and then AEW, and I'm so at my wit's end by the time I finish with slogging through Raw that I'm afraid I don't give AEW the benefit of the doubt all the time. So I thought this week I will reverse it. (laughs) I'll watch AEW and then Raw. And I picked the week to do that, that AEW presented potentially the worst television program that they have ever broadcast to an unsuspecting public. Can you remember one that had less redeeming quality? I'm sure I'm sure there may have been one or two with less redeeming quality, because at least there was a segment or two on this show that I thought was productive and okay. 90 seconds of Wardlow and MJF is not worth two hours of my life. You're not wrong about that. All right. So at the at the very open of this thing, and now, by the way, somebody somebody had the perfect, as several people did, had the perfect comment about the Bing Bing Bang Bing Bang 
Bing bang, walla walla bing bang. The bing bang theory. <laughs> ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, bing bang, walla walla bing bang. They had the perfect statement about the bing bang theory. They said the big, the difference between the big bang theory and always sunny is always sunny is a smart show about stupid people and a the big bang theory is a stupid show about smart people that's the best way to fucking look at it so they're trying to keep the big bangers with a hot match at the start they bring adam cole out his big entrance which now unfortunately is the best part of adam's game he's at color and the qualifying match for the owen hart invitational tournament Bobby Fish versus Jeff Hardy. O'Reilly and Fish's corner, Matt in Jeff's corner. So we've gotten to this point in, what, four weeks? We have gone from Jeff Hardy making his debut in the reunion of the Hardy Boys to a month later, he's in a qualifying match to get into a tournament. Knox was the referee, so that's a bad sign. Um, but honestly, we didn't need Knox to sabotage this match. I will say Adam Cole is well-spoken with bass in his voice on color. He sounds convincing. If you're not looking at him and you're not looking at his matches where he never actually wins anything, just listening to his voice doing color, you would still think that maybe he had credibility. It's amazing how that they can find the weakness in everybody they sign and accentuate that weakness as much as possible. Did you hear Roderick Strong has asked for his release multiple times this year and they've turned him down? They got plans for him over there. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. His wife's over there. His best friends are over there. We all knew this was coming. But now, unfortunately, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place because... I guess, I don't know. I mean, I, I had to yell at Roddy. Did I ever tell you a story, Roddy and the Midget? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. I had to yell at Roderick Strong on the phone one time. We were just in the process of Sinclair was just buying Ring of Honor. And we were about to go on television on 60-something television stations across the country that would blow away that fucking rotten HD net audience that nobody saw. And we get a phone call, and Roderick Strong has just signed a contract to Ring of Honor to appear on our television. Said, well, there's something I shot a couple of years ago. Apparently, it's now going to air on some television network. I can't remember, some cable network. I said, what? He said, apparently, uh, this was in 2011, so somewhere around 2009 or so, Roddy went with some friends of his in Florida to a reality TV show shoot where at some point he was going to play the part of a a person at a college frat party or something. And basically he got beat up by a midget on this reality TV show scene. Beat up and or choked out by a midget. So he'll fit in in AEW. Well, but that's a, I had to tell, I had to say, you mean to tell me that I've got to call Joe Coff, the new owner of Ring of Honor Wrestling, new representative of the owners, and I've got to tell him that one of the fucking wrestlers that I've just implored him to sign that we can't do without is about to be on television getting choked out by a fucking midget. I said, how much did they pay you for that? Well, it was just for fun. They gave us free beer. Fuck! And it took me 10 or 15 minutes to explain to him why that it was detrimental to his career that he was about to be a pro wrestler on a brand new television program and was going to be seen by at least a limited number of people who ever watches that horse shit reality TV show, whatever the fuck it was. He was about to be seen getting choked out by a midget. I said, certainly right before Rocky III was released, you remember where Hulk Hogan put over a paraplegic nun? Fuck. So he'll probably be up for doing anything as long as it's fun with his friends. And then my 
the last one that my opinion of wouldn't be ruined but nevertheless so this match with bobby fish and jeff hardy bobby fish could take poor jeff hardy apart in 30 seconds in a legitimate contest and i know that wrestling perception is reality but can anybody look at bobby fish in the shape he's in and then look at jeff who it looks painful for him to walk let's just say that this match did not take advantage of either man's attributes or present either in a positive light it, it whether it was a style clash or just but let me ask you that is jeff hardy bulletproof how long can he have matches like this and still be over. Will it hurt some? Will it hurt none? Will it hurt a lot? I don't think he's bulletproof. I think if it keeps happening the way it's been happening, it will hurt because he gets that big pike. It's a massive pop. And you wonder where that's coming from. Like how much of that audience is just people who love him off WWE TV. But then mm -hmm. the matches fall apart. It's the tag matches. It's now the singles matches. And, you know, just like with Adam Cole and Keith Lee in NXT, as crazy as it sounds, maybe Jeff Hardy's a guy that's just better fit for WWE. He certainly hits the Swanton better off ropes than cables. God damn, he's he's hitting the Swanton now for real. I don't know why one son of a bitch would be laying there for it. I'm so, I'm sorry, don't know. I've heard somebody said on Twitter, well, now he just tells guys, you know, it's going to be stiff and he apologizes ahead of time. Fuck you. I will not be there if you're going to land on me like that. I will be somewhere else, and you will miss me. And that's, I, I'm wondering whether it's people that like Jeff from the memory of some of his WWF matches from longer ago. But should either Hardy in this, in AEW, in this environment at this time, should either one of them be in a singles match to begin with at all? They shouldn't be in singles matches. They probably shouldn't be giving away too many matches that aren't on pay-per-view, and they should really do everything they can to get them healthy and ready for a good pay-per-view match. Because that's really, at this point, with their age and who they are, that's, what, that's the best that you could hope for. And, you know, I've always been a fan of the Hardys, and I recognize that they were over. And in their youth, <laughs> they were tremendous risk takers and performers and etc but they don't need to be doing that at this point in their late 40s middle 40s whatever and as well we said that once that they got the hardys they should have had the big reunion pay-per-view match against the the hardly boys their doppelgangers because that would be the big money if there was any to be had and that opportunity has already left the barn. People have seen them in singles and in tags against underneath talent. Jeff's matches don't actually make a lot of sense to begin with and never did because he one of the, he's like Rob Van Dam, Argentina Rocca. His own fucking style works for him. Nobody else could do it. But in this case, just Fish gives one of those Falcon arrows to Jeff off the top rope, gets a two count, then gets an ankle lock, and Jeff gets the rope break. And then immediately Fish charges, and Jeff just hits an elbow, springs, well, doesn't spring. There was not a lot of springing in this match, but he goes up to the top and does a diving, spinning backflip off the top toward Fish, but Fish had to stand there and wait for it. And then when he saw that Jeff was going to completely miss him, Fish tried to bend over real quick to try to get under him, and Jeff's leg grazed the back of Fish's head. Before Jeff took the horrible bump, Fish was barely touched, so he had to fall backwards and sell and lay there until Jeff got back to the top, which took a while. And poor Fish lay in there like he's been shot. And then the swanton lands right on him. I'm sorry, fuck you. No. And then one, two, three, Fish loses again. So now Bobby Fish, that's one of the better workers in the company and a legitimately MMA trained guy with a varied background just come into the company and he's jobbing to guys that can't even hit the fucking moves and potato him while he's laying down for him. 
Boy, the business has changed because that would have been a fucking fist fight. And then the Hardly Boys do come to the ring for the face-off with the Hardy Boys. And you could hear a fucking mouse pissing on cotton. The people didn't give a fuck. That horse has left the barn. And then finally Matt tries to get them to do the delete, delete, because they wasn't making any noise. They like delete. They were probably wishing they could have deleted what they'd just seen. But that did you, am I being biased or was there not a massive groundswell of interest in the Hardys and the Hardleys? I don't think there was a lot of interest. I think also from the moment Adam Cole came out there because of the way he's been used, I don't think it means as much. And I think there's a reason why this show started out so much lower than previous weeks in the ratings. And I think this was unappealing. And you know, whatever Jeff Hardy had that was special coming in, Jesus Christ, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> I think it's Jeff Hardy landing on someone up there. Jeff, Jeff Hardy's being dropped from a helicopter on your roof as we speak. But whatever special he had coming in, it's gone. And whatever... They're going to still do the Bucks and the Hardy Boys because those two teams have wanted that and wanted to do it. They wanted to do a big run on the Indies a few years ago when Matt Hardy went back to WWE, I believe. So they'll do it, but just like with... The Hardy Boys, I've been telling you for a while, I think a lot of people are burned down on the Bucks. The Bucks have go-away heat with a lot of people in my eyes, and also a lot of people are just indifferent to them now, and I think you saw some of that here. Well, I'll tell you one thing. We've argued before on whether the Bucks were smart enough to know what they were doing when they bury people and do it anyway to get that accomplished, or whether they're just completely ignorant of wrestling. And if this is a program that they wanted to do and that they have any fucking hope for and they've put it together like this and let the other things that have gone on with the Hardys in the last month go on that means they really are just that fucking ignorant and have no idea what they're doing because if if they if they had any confidence in this they wouldn't have started it out and put it together like this if they knew what they were doing anyway they did a nice package nice package on William Regal and the Blackpool Combat Club with Regal doing the voiceover and him showing the guys how to rough people up. I'd like to see more of that and less of their fucking matches. And Regal's always good, but then they play Danielson's music, and for a second I'm like, yes! Yes, let's see some Danielson. But then there's more music, and here comes Yuta, and then there's more music, and here comes Moxley, and we got another goddamn six-man tag team match. And they might as well just run last week's tape because it's the same thing. The the opponents are different. It's Butcher and Baker and Angelico. And this time, the Butcher jumps Moxley on the floor and uh, all the other guys jump each other and the ref calls for the bell. And every week it's the same fucking match and they end up stomping the shit out of all the opponents and winning the match. And... I'd just love to see Danielson in a singles match in an interview again so I could enjoy something instead of always having that fucking plumber latched onto him like a goddamn leech. And as well as... Uh, do you see any redeeming value in this? What was different? I didn't have a big problem with it just because it was the same as it's been and the crowd is super into it and they seem to be getting you to over with that crowd because they're reacting to him. Again, all of that doesn't take away from the fact that this was incredibly counterproductive to the booking of Brian Danielson, and I don't care if this is what he wanted to do, and this is what Regal wanted to do, or anything else. When you saw the direction they were going in, it blows my mind still that this is where they ended up going with Brian Danielson, but it's also come out now that I guess Tony Khan has ordered trios championships. Oh, have boy. A trios division. You gotta oh, figure geez. that may be where, because we've seen them in six-man tag matches oh. the last like month on TV. That may be where they're going. So they're going to have a six-man title, too. So everybody gets a belt. All right. Um, I, I've, yeah. Starks and Hobbs, speaking of belts for the tag team title, Starks and Hobbs are in the back, and they speak for six whole words on challenging the tag team champions, and in comes Jungle Boy with Dino Douche and Christian Cage, the world's... Highest paid manager now. 
And immediately, Jungle Boy starts talking in the monotone, high-pitched, unconvincing voice that he has that takes me out of it. And then Dino Douche growls like a blithering simpleton. And for whatever reason, they will give Starks and Hobbs a tag team title shot at their AEW World Tag Team title if Jungle Boy first gets a shot at Ricky Starks's non-sanctioned, non-existent, not real FTW belt that we haven't heard or seen anything about in months except he wears it around. So Jungle Boy wants to win a belt that's not real, and if he does, then he will defend his real belt that he's got. And again... Let's remind ourselves that the World Tag Team Champions in AEW are the sixth top-rated tag team in the fucking company. They're behind FTR. They're behind the Hardleys. They're behind the Hardys. They're behind Starks and Hobbs. They're behind... Well, Santana and Ortiz are never a team anymore. They just get beaten singles. Swerve did a promo for a second, then Keith Lee gave us a little lecture. Uh, And then Wardlow thankfully walked into the arena with security and handcuffed, and then he got unhandcuffed to have the match. Wardlow versus MJF's mystery opponent. They've dropped all these subtle hints that told us exactly who it was. And MJF and Spears come out, and they give the big intro to William Morrissey. So now he's gone from a member of Velvet Underground to being the head of a talent agency. I didn't realize that William Morrissey was still young enough. He's been a talent agent for what, since the 50s in in Hollywood? So you go with William Morris and the Velvet on the Ground. Your mind doesn't go to the Smiths at all when you hear Morrissey. Ah, Smiths, Jones, whatever. So physically, to me, from the neck down, this guy looks great and he's seven feet tall. Facially, he looks 50 years old and like a fucking Jiffy Lube employee. And I think that's because I've never seen this guy wrestle. Remember, we weren't watching the WWF when he and Enzo Amore were a thing for a while. And I wondered what, what the, why they would let a seven-footer go. Now I know. And this is my prediction, just so everybody knows. Wardlow is a star. He's the complete package. He's got the size he's got the physique he's got the he's a handsome man he can move for that size but he's also got the power he's got body language he pulls a lot of this shit off he's got fucking oomph to him he can show explosiveness he's picking this up he will be a star william morrissey is seven feet tall and got a pretty good physique, but he is an indie guy, and that's where he's going to stay. He needs some work to compete at a high level in some of the mid-level promotions. His work is not necessarily anything to write home about. Um, He's got kind of minor league personality, not a lot of charisma. Comes off to me as a guy you would see working on top in indie promotions, but he's not a major league star, and he's not going to be. That's my prediction. Wardlow is. William Morrissey is not. These are the differences. And somebody proved me wrong. Save this tape in five years. Let's go back and reflect. Having said that, I stand by what I said last week. These people don't want to see Wardlow sell, even for a guy that's bigger than he is. I think it's counterproductive. And also... (sighs) Wardlow did a moonsault body block off the top rope. The reason for it was because he can, apparently. Because Morrissey had to stand there and wait for it. And then Wardlow over-rotated and went over the top of Morrissey and pretty much landed on his feet and could have broken his leg or blown his knee and then fell down over the top of him. But at least that being a surprise thing got the people back into it because... As long as Wardlow was looking good, they were chanting for him. They were into it. When Wardlow starts selling, especially for a guy like The Butcher or a guy like Morrissey here, that I'm not saying they're 
horrible and without any redeeming value. They're never going to be stars. They need to be on indies working indies because that's their level and that's where they're going to stay. And to see either one of these guys beating shit out of Wardlow was counterproductive. But he got the people back into it and then hit one power bomb. One, two, three. I don't know that I wouldn't have gone with the four power bombs on a seven foot guy, even if, unless he couldn't just couldn't fucking get the big fucking bastard up four times. I still might have done four because the people love it. But he had to have some gas left in the tank because the best part of this entire television show was the following 90 seconds. And that's where they bring the security back to cuff him back up. And he says, fuck you. And he beat up seven security guards. And then they ran another 10 or 12 down and he beat them up. And they were great staggered entrances in that it wasn't a pack of people standing there in full plain sight and then one at a time running at him. It was people coming out of the fucking entranceway as fast as they could and cutting mud to the ring and getting in there and boom and gone, boom and gone, boom and gone. And every time he'd hammer one or throw one or lay one out or kick one or whatever, it got better and the people got into it. And then he picked up one of the little milk sops and threw him over the top rope onto all the others on the floor and vowed revenge on MJF. Said he's going to get even and he's going to get out of his contract. And that's the way you get a fucking star over. And he carried his end of it great. And now, finally, MJF has offered a match where if Wardlow wins, he gets out of his contract. But the condition is there's going to be special conditions, and he will let them, or he will reveal them at the contract signing next week in the most magical place on earth, Long Island, New York. A place I'm sure is near and dear to your heart as well, Brian. Of course. But this was, this was laid out well. And Wardlow's, with the security and the blah, 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 and Wardlow's fire made this the best part of the program. It wasn't even close. Your thoughts. Yeah, this is the best part of the program. Nothing else close. Wardlow is more over every week. This is working. What they're doing is working. MJF and Spears selling what Wardlow is doing with just their facial expressions has been great. I will also say that. <laughs> Let me ask you: is is yeah. that is that construction team up there? Is, are they are they putting in a a boiling pit of oil that you can eliminate your, your rivals and no, enemies no, in or no. what? It's just more surveillance stuff. But anyway, let me get back uh, to what I was saying. Yeah. I thought William Morrissey, the former big cast looked fine. And you know, the biggest thing he had to contend with and it was the loudest chant of the night was we want Enzo. No, we don't. <laughs> that was the loudest chant, but he looked fine. I thought he did. All right. I agree with you about his face. Like he has the seven foot tall muscular build. But facially, there's something like you don't buy him as like a big badass or something. He looks like a parking lot attendant. Yeah, and I'm not saying he couldn't kick some ass, but you don't buy it when you just, you know, based on just look. But Wardlow is, fuck. But Wardlow is super over. He's more over by the week. This has been working. It's been the highlight of every show. And the fans, everywhere they go, no matter where it is, the fans are super into Wardlow. Well, maybe he'll be the next world champion because the one they got now ain't a star and now they're trying to figure out how to make him a star after the fact. Did I miss where they explained why Adam Page has suddenly gone from the upright, heroic, millennial cowboy to an asshole that hates CM Punk and wants to destroy him and embarrass him and tells him that his fucking matches are mas masturbatory Bret Hart tributes? What did we miss here? What? Who crapped in Adam Page's post toasties that morning? I don't know. Maybe he's just upset about Stu Grayson being released. Well, it's, it, or not, not, not being released, not being renewed. Yeah. If we said there was nothing to be excited and happy about this week, you just mentioned one thing. We don't have to look at that. The dork orders losing members, but Tony Schiavone introduces the world champion, Adam Page, the champ, big entrance, in-ring interview about the main event, Double or Nothing, CM Punk. 
Shivani asks him a question. Paige reaches, takes the microphone out of Tony's hand, does not even acknowledge his presence. Tony just meekly walks out of the ring. And then Paige says, yeah, it'd be easy to say good things about CM Punk in this match, but I'm not because there won't be a handshake or a mas masturbatory Bret Hart tribute because I'm going to destroy Punk. And then the people start chanting Punk. And then Paige tells one of the fans with a Punk shirt on that he's going to be asking for a refund when he gets finished with Punk. I, actually, that was good. This first part of his promo was same as always with Paige. Prepared shit in a monotonous delivery. But then once he got started on that fan and he got into it, a turning heel, I'll embarrass you. That was a little better. Maybe he's got potential as a heel to be more interesting. But doesn't there need to, and Punk wasn't there on this show, so obviously he had no way of having any quality control. I don't know whether he knew what they were going to do. But did this make any sense whatsoever that otherwise than if you're just going to admit, yeah, our world champion is a boring twat and nobody gives a shit, so we're going to switch the boring little bitch heel and give him some balls, but we didn't have time for anything to happen for there to be a reason for it, so he's just going to come out and be an asshole straight out of nowhere. Is that what we just saw? There's nothing else we have seen unless there was some provocation on YouTube. There was nothing else that we have seen that led us to have any idea that Adam Page would be turning heel, seemingly turning heel with this promo against CM Punk. Who wasn't there? Seemingly? Jesus Christ, would the people start booing your babyface world champion and chanting for his opponent? I think that's more than seemingly, especially when he's calling them assholes and telling people that they're going to fucking hate their favorite wrestler by the time he gets finished with him. So did, this couldn't have been accidental, could it? Are they that fucking far gone? Maybe he's frustrated because he hears what everyone else is saying. That he's been a horrible world champion. Blame the booker! Yeah, if you're someone into match quality, maybe you like his stuff, but the AEW world title means less than half the other titles in the company right now. Plus that big six-man tag team title coming up. They got, if they, they put the got six man, hey, if they put the six man tag title on the Blackpool Fight Club, it means more than the AEW World Championship right now. If you put it on Danielson and Moxley with an emerging Yuta with Regal, yeah, it yeah. means more than Paige right now. Yeah. Well, but you, you don't disagree, well, I guess. Okay. I do. I do not disagree. Anything would mean more. But I, again, that's why I'm I'm pissed off. They had the best world champion uh, in all of professional wrestling ready to go in December, Brian Danielson. And they fucking shot themselves in the foot. So they've announced that Jay Lethal will be wrestling Friday on Rampage. By the way, this Friday, that's 5.30 Eastern time on Friday afternoon. Oh, shit. It's about to start. <laughs> yeah. Shit, that's right. It is. This is... But, well, we're not going to be covering that, folks. We won't be able to stretch it out another hour. But uh, he's wrestling some Japanese outlaw guy they're bringing over from DDT. Uh, so they, it's like, it's like somebody in Japan, if they were to say, oh, we've got a big hookup for American talent, a big promotion in America going to send us all their talent. And then they find out it's fucking Ian Rotten's promotion. Uh Sanjay Dutt and Jay Lethal can both talk better than 85% of the AEW roster, though, by the way. So then we have Santana with Ortiz versus Jericho with the Jericho Appreciators. And did you make note of how this match started, <laughs> Brian? Oh, I did not make note of that, no. Jump start on the floor. The second time in the same television show, they started a match with a jump start on the floor. The second time in an hour. So Santana's got Ortiz in his corner. Jericho has the four Japs, the Jericho appreciators. And they have a big fight on the floor while referee Aubrey poses, trying to recreate the John Travolta Saturday Night Fever poster. And then Santana set up the ring steps, but Jericho went over and grabbed the camera away from the cameraman 
to try to to taunt Santana, but Santana stopped him and took the camera back. So Jericho hid behind Aubrey, and then Santana ran Jericho into the stairs, and then they got in the ring, and now the bell rang to start the match. And they went 15 seconds, and Jericho knocked Santana off the apron of the ring, flat onto the steel stairs, and they went to a break. And when they come back, Jericho was getting heat on Santana, and Santana was fighting back and made a lackluster comeback that Jericho fed for in a lackluster way and then did the three amigos, and that got people into it. And then Santana hit a frog splash, Cowella splash. I don't know how froggy it was. Got a two count, but this match was drudgery. And even if we haven't been a fan of most of Jericho's recent work, he's not usually this blah, and Santana looked blah. It was just blah. They traded p- pissy little chops. Santana hit a nice cutter. Everybody's doing the cutter now. But one of the Jericho appreciators got the baseball bat and was on the floor and was going to try to use it, but Ortiz took it and hit two of them. And Santana got a two count with the lariat, but then Santana squished Jericho in the corner with a cannonball. The heels distracted. The Santana, Jericho hit a nut shot, which is Adam Cole's deal. And then hit the Judas one, two, three. So now, apparently the go-to for veterans to tell the young guy, I'm going to beat you, but I'm going to hit you in the balls first so it gives you an out. That's apparently the new, I won't come in your mouth and the check is in the mail. Because now it's just constant ball shots and then hitting your finish and the guy still beat flattered and a plate full of piss but he takes it better, I guess, personally. Is that what it is? Oh, I don't know. This sucked. Jericho sucked. Uh, Jericho always sucks. Santana and Ortiz have been so misused. I don't even know what they could do anymore. The whole Jericho Appreciation Society has already jumped the shark. The drilling going on upstairs sounds more (laughs) pleasant than everything I have to watch with Jericho. Even if it was on your right molar. Um, And And nothing ever gets anyone else over. The MJF feud didn't get MJF over. The Eddie Kingston feud. Eddie Kingston means less now than he meant a few months ago. Santana and Ortiz mean somehow even less now than they meant months ago. And this is terrible. And he looks like Big Earn out there with the wig flying around all over the place. All after the match where the heels won, then all five heels beat up the two baby faces with bad look and heat. Jericho using a bat in a totally unnatural way. <laughs> and then they just stood there and raised their arms and quit. Nobody made him quit. And Santana and Ortiz, again, look like fucking idiots. <sighs> but then, 20 more seconds of positivity. Samoa Joe did a great, serious promo about Jay Lethal, and they gave him 20 seconds to talk. That was it. But, maybe he could... Samoa Joe qualifies as Asian Pacific Heritage, right? I believe so, yes. Last time we checked, Samoa was out there in the Pacific. Well, Tony Khan did a little interview where he's now, he's basically using Asian Pacific Heritage Month as an excuse to foist off the outlaw talent from Japan that is friends with Twinkle Toes that he's going to be bringing in. He had to make sure to say, we're going to be using a lot of Japanese folks, a lot of Samoan folks, all the APH folks. And this is going to be how they excuse hiring amateur dipwits from outlaw shows in Japan to come over here. And do you think at least Twinkle Toes is getting a 10% booking fee as a kickback for getting all these unheard of jackoffs jobs? Well, I saw the main event on Friday is Riho versus one of the uh, Japanese women who had been here before. But the bigger question is, Tony has now shown there are some people he gets tired of. The way we got tired of them, the way other people we think would get tired of them. And maybe at some point he says, you know what? The stuff that really works in the women's division isn't the stuff that Kenny's bringing over from Japan. And Kenny's not really a good day-to-day booker. But we'll see what happens. 
and checks in the mail, and we know where the splooge is going. Um, <laughs> the gun club, <laughs> the gun club, Billy and Austin and Colton, and Colton, Colton confronted the acclaimed. They're both heel teams. And they got them gifts. They were wrapped up gift boxes, and they unwrapped the boxes, and they gave them pairs of scissors. And they were happy to receive the scissors, apparently. What do I not understand about this? Oh, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly sure what this was. We said we want them to use the acclaimed then the gun club better, and somehow this was the solution. The only other note I'll say is Billy Gunn was in there, and you know, I don't know what he's on, but I need to get on it. He looks phenomenal. What is he on? You know what? There there was actually, there was an interview that I saw, I think it was on Inside the Ropes uh, website, that he's talking about since he started really seriously bodybuilding. Could, but it, Billy Gunn was like Shelton Benjamin in the 90s or in the 2000s. It was a fucking rib. Shelton never went to the gym, could eat anything, McDonald's. And he was in amazing cardio shape and, and it never gained an ounce. And Billy Gunn was the same way. He could eat anything. And he was one of those guys that got heat with the rest of the boys. But now, apparently, he got into bodybuilding when he reduced his wrestling schedule. And that were, they're all the nutritionists in that world, he, he's almost 60. And, he, and I'm not trying to say that he never has, or I don't know anything about it, taking any supplements. But he's almost 60, and he's working with his kids, and he's so happy about it and excited about it that he's eating like he's a competition bodybuilder and takes his own food in boxes and bags everywhere he goes to do all the right shit and works out like a madman. No, it's certainly that, and, not steroids. It's certainly well, no, I'm he not takes saying, his food with him on the road in his lunchbox. That has to be well, the solution. But you, can't, but you can't look like that. Hey, let me tell you something. I could take as many steroids as they've created in history, and I still wouldn't look like that. And I'm not putting them down. It's genetics, and it's training, not, and it's diet, and it's all that stuff. But bless him that he gives a shit at that point of his life. My point isn't, how dare you use steroids? My point is... How dare you not tell me what you're doing so I could do it to better myself? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. He looks great. I need to look like that. What is he on? Are they horse steroids? Are they oh, monkey hormones? On. What are you've they? Ne you've never seen a horse with abs He's like He's built that. like Secretariat. Look at his neck. It's all muscle. What the <laughs> fuck? What is he on? I want to get some. I'll tell you what. He's the only person. Billy Gunn, I've told him this too. He can make you tap out with a handshake. It's like you're grabbing hold of a goddamn steel grappling hook. But any, I don't understand the scissors. I don't know what they were all happy about the scissors. It's they use that to cut open the shipments when they come in. Well, it's oh come on now, <laughs> keep a box cutter for that type of thing. There's got to be something to do with scissors and pop culture that I ain't getting. So speaking of things I didn't get, fuck me. They actually pitched to this. This was a clip from Dark. Remember, we've said if they wanted anybody to know what's going on on YouTube or even that there is a YouTube show, they ought to play clips back every once in a while on TBS, right? Or on the big network. Right. So this is the one they picked. This is the worst. This was the worst segment I believe I've seen on wrestling television. I don't know. Because there was no redeeming value of this. At least football field fuckery had a couple of recognized legitimate stars in it. At least, you know, th th there's been something. This was. Folks, they open on the ring with Brian Pillman Jr., poor fella, and Griff Garrison and Julia Hart in the ring. And poor Brian had to give this prepared statement about their encounter with the House of Black months ago that led to the, this is a quote, poisoning of the mind of Julia Hart. There's Julia Hart back there. She's a cute little thing. Looks like a cheerleader. I don't recall her being rotten. She might have been good one of these days, but they've got her still wearing that eye patch from where Malachi Black missed her on live television, blowing the mist in her eyes, missed completely, missed the mist. But now she's also got... It was like six months ago. 
But besides that, <laughs> did you see under the patch she's got some kind of black bruising and growth on her face that they've made up underneath the eye patch that looks like the fucking... If it was green, it would look like the shit that was crawling all over Stephen King and Creepshow. So it's given her some kind of infection that's turning her facial skin black. And Brian then gives the John Harbaugh quote because he's the coach in Baltimore and he was Brian Sr.'s roommate and friend. <laughs> and he does that and gets a slight amount of interest from the fans, but this material was so horrible. Nobody cared. And it's just anybody that would come up with a story should be sent away to prison <laughs> or be forced to watch the members of their family disemboweled in front of them. There's no punishment too heinous. Force them to watch anybody. this. Force them to watch that all that punishment is too heinous. Nobody should have been forced to watch this. But to send this kid out to tell a story like this, this hokey bullshit that he knew that everybody knew was bullshit and he was ended up trying so hard that he started screaming and squeaking trying to put all the passion he had into it to make up for the rotten creative and the fucking girl's rotted flesh and then he calls out the house of black and the lights go out for 30 or 45 seconds and they try to do the big horror movie entrance Nobody gives a shit again. And these guys get, they get in there and the baby faces that have this horrible grudge against them for six months ago and that they poisoned Julia's mind. They just stand there slack jawed and dumbfounded while the heels do their whole entrance and put themselves in all the positions they're supposed to be in. And everybody stares at each other, standing there motionless. And then suddenly the heels just attack the baby faces standing there, punk them out. They get no offense. They just boom, punch them, drop, hit them with some awkward shit. And then what have I been saying since the first time Malachi Black showed up? His work in the ring and his look had potential. And then he'd do some bullshit mind games, spooky mental entertainment shit or whatever that just makes it all caca. And that's what they did here. The heels stare at Julia. Then they hand her a chair. And she's supposed to hit Griff Garrison, who is laying beneath the feet of this five foot, hundred pound blonde girl that can barely pick this chair up. And he's fully conscious. And he's sitting up holding his hand up, pleading, no, no, don't hit me. The only thing he didn't think of to do was just stand the fuck up and take the chair away from her. But she can't do it. She can't hit him. Maybe it's because she can't pick the fucking chair up. But she can't bring herself to do it. So Malachi grabs her, and this looked unsavory to say the least because here's this big jacked up tattooed fucking freak with shit pierced in his face manhandling this except for the eye patch and the makeup this polite blonde girl half his size and he rips her eye patch off and then here comes Pac and the Lucha Brothers out running to save her even though her her friends and partners are right there doing fuck all of nothing. I wrote, what is fucking happening? So in summation, and you can give me your thoughts, to me, Malachi Black, Brody King, and their little pal Buddy are officially the most embarrassingly fucking rotten heel pro wrestlers in the world. I never want to see Julia Hart again. This is phony as a football bat. Griff Garrison, to me, has always been a waste of fucking time. He looks like Pippi Longstocking. And I don't ever want to see Brian Pillman Jr. again. I was friends with his father and pulling for him for the past couple of years. And after seeing this, I don't ever want to see him again. This is, that was the perfect way to squander anything positive 
Brian Pillman could have ever contributed to wrestling by putting him in this, along with the fucking his street urchin fucking manager, Julia, and his ineffective, feckless partner, Griff, and these three dumb shit fucking heels. Your thoughts. God damn. Let me start by just saying I've been consistent. I've not been a fan of this stuff with the House of Black. It's different than Danielson, but you can make the same sort of argument with Malachi Black when he came in. He was fresh. He was hot. The fans were into him. The fans completely turned on Cody. The one, Whatever fans Cody had left completely turned because Malachi was so cool. Yeah. And then they put him in a trio, so now he means nothing. And he Well, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. I must, I must jump in. Before the partners, he started meaning nothing because he started doing the stupid mind That's true. game shit that, that looked phony and was inexplicable and nobody could figure it out. And it's become clear now what he likes and what he thinks wrestling is. And he doesn't want to do wrestling. This guy doesn't want to be a professional wrestler. This guy wants to be an actor because this is all performance. The spooky entrance, the music, the lights, the dress up. They play dress up. They're putting makeup on their face for this. And then the whole WWE draw it out. Take forever and draw it out. It's not a good, good idea to draw things out when no one cares. <laughs> no one at all cares. So and you're going to the, say that they're making up for the suckiness by making it last longer. And then the few people that did care decided that they wanted the House of Black to take Julia Hart for who knows what reason. This is irredeemably bad. The House of Black is awful. Their segments are always awful. We don't need one part of the show that's the spiritual part of the show. I don't mean spiritual like religious. I mean like dark spirits have taken over the arena. Lights go on. They go off. Makeup. This, none of this. Get rid of all this. The guy can't even do the fucking mist. Whoa. He can't even do the fucking mist. The one thing. Fucking Julia Hart's out there. He didn't even get her in the face. And we have to sit through all this shit. This is where Tony Khan needs to put his foot down. I know a lot of these guys want to do their own thing and they all have ideas and they're coming to AEW. Some guys are coming there for the idea that I could finally do the things I've wanted to do in WWE that Vince shot down. Some of these guys are idiots and they don't get it at all and it's bad. And I'm not saying they're not talented. Malachi Black should absolutely go do some spiritual, crazy, evil kickboxing movie. He'll be amazing. But this segment was one of the all-time worst AEW segments in history. And not in a redeemable way. Not in a Maki Ito singing while Hikaru Shida is destroyed by Vicky Guerrero. Not in a Jade Cargill coming out there and no one knows what the hell's going on. But in a, wow, this is the worst episode of AEW I've seen in a very long time kind of way. This was one of the worst segments ever. And it shouldn't happen again. You brought up an interesting point. Is the dork order going to sue for gimmick infringement since... Aren't they that, that's in, a good example. in the House of Black stepping over into the Dork Order territory? Join the Dork Order. We can fucking fulfill your needs. Well, so can the House of Black. Well, now they're competing for recruits. And both Terrible. of them happen to be the worst heel group gimmicks in the history of wrestling. And just when we said that about Dork Order, then the black fella said, oh, my beer, we can outsuck them. And there's less of us. It took eight or nine guys for the dork order to suck that bad, but only three for the House of Black. And the House of Black is losing fans. Whatever you want to say about the dork order, when they had that episode where they attacked the Young Bucks, there was a shift in how they were used. And then after the passing of Brody Lee, obviously there was a complete shift in how they were used because you couldn't have them as heels anymore. The fans accepted them. I think the House of Black, every time they're out there, more and more fans are groaning. Oh, the lights are out. They're going to come on. Oh, he's got his horns on his head. Oh, his other friends are waiting in the back to walk out there with some purpose with him. What the fuck is this? Go to Hollywood. Who is, by the way, the goat man, the goat guy with the horns and everything. The goat man? The goat guy. He's got the horns and the fucking weird mask and everything. Isn't that a goat? Some kind of Satan symbol, the goat horns or the fucking oh, whatever. I don't know. I, I don't know. Or apparently he just, he's into animal husbandry. I don't know. <laughs> Then we had a dream match up next. Um, a dream match, they called it. I asked the question, whose dream? What kind of drugs and or fever sickness causes those dreams? Another qualifying match for the Owen Hart tournament, Dante Martin against Felix. This is a dream. Who said, 
Where have been the petitions screaming at the top of people's lungs? We got to see Dante Martin against Felix. It's two baby faces. They've never had any interaction. I don't know whether either guy has ever mentioned the other guy's name to come out of their lips, but it's a dream match just because they both do a bunch of gymnastics with no thought or logic behind it. So guess what they did, Brian? A bunch of gymnastics <laughs> with no thought or logic behind it. I figured. They lock up, shove, series of ridiculous kung fu movie moves, and to break in 60 seconds. But I did notate that in this match, breaks would be welcome. Uh, they came back just observations, because I don't know what the fuck they were doing. Dante punches like a high school girl. They did some backflips, but I couldn't tell which one was supposed to sell and which one was supposed to be happy about it. Uh, they did more fake choreography. Dante is getting better with his facials. I will say that. He had some facial expressions. So did I. Most of them, same kind I get when I have upset stomach from eating bad food. It was fucking rotten. There was no flow here, no logic, no timing. The work was sloppy, except the contrived gymnastics. They can land perfectly, but a punch or a kick or a simple wrestling move looks like first day wrestling class. So then my favorite spot, you, you, you got to know it. Did you watch this match or are you just humoring me? Did you see it? I did watch this match. I didn't watch it terribly closely because I'd lost a lot of interest in the show by this point, but I did watch it. But you know what had to be my favorite point in this match. What's that? They both start fighting to go up on the top rope, right? And they do the thing where they both take forever to get to the top rope. And then they both stand up on the top rope with both feet balancing together by holding onto each other. And then they both jumped off the top rope and backflipped into the ring and landed in mid-ring on their feet, standing up, still holding on to each other, and people applauded. There was no move! That was amazing. Nobody, nobody did anything to the other guy. It was two guys that climbed up to the top rope held each other and worked together to do a backflip and land on their feet. And the people applauded. It was no wrestling. There was no move. There was no offense. Nobody hit anybody. Nobody was, it was just, they dropped all the pretense and said, we're just out here jacking off doing flips. Will you applaud a flip with no move? And they did. And then they did some more flips and Felix won. And just at that point, I said, I have cheeseburgers waiting because that was my gift to myself for getting through Raw and AEW. And I have to keep moving and I don't want to see any more of this. But then Sting and Darby Allen pop up on the screen. And I said, before I turn it off, because there's about 20 minutes left in this fucking show, I will see what's going on here. And Darby is facing Jeff Hardy in a singles match. On pay-per-view? No. In the first round of the tournament on free television. Jeff Hardy versus Darby Allen. They might have got somebody's money for that. Not after they saw it once, but the first time. But we don't have to worry about that because Darby did a promo about the match. And in that monotone, boring voice where he sounds like a hypnosis victim. He said it was going to be a real special night. And then Sting reinforced that for 10 seconds. He didn't howl. He didn't beat his chest. He didn't say it's showtime. He has now adopted Darby Allen's promo style, which is act like you're talking in your sleep and say nothing. So now instead of Sting bringing Darby up, Darby's bringing Sting down. Does this motherfucker talk like this in real life? And if he does, can anybody hear him? And why would anybody listen to him? And is it possible that can we, is, is, is he got iron poor blood? Does he need a goddamn vitamin? Can we, is he got 
What do they call it? What did Mr. Hughes have? Narcolepsy. When you just go to sleep at random times? Is that what Darby Allen's problem is? Or is he just a really boring motherfucker with nothing to say? Because I'm starting to wonder. Yeah, he, he may just have nothing to say. So I'm fucking done. I quit. I don't, they had a girls match. I don't care. I don't know what else they did. I don't care. I couldn't make it through two hours of this. Well, before we wrap things up on the show and talking about Dynamite, did you see that this week they did 833,000 viewers? On Dynamite? On Dynamite. Well, what did the, wait a minute, what did, what did they start out? And Because certainly to God, nobody that started at the start of this program could make it all the way to the end. I couldn't have been alone. So did they start normal and lose more people because of the putrefaction factor of the presentation? Or they just didn't get them to begin with? Uh, hold on, I'm pulling up a segment-by-segment segment breakdown. Okay. The opening with Adam Cole coming out and Hardy versus Fish. They had 857,000 viewers. Ooh. The sec- Wait a minute, was the Big Bang Theory preempted? What was their lead-in? Was it normal? Actually, I don't know, because I don't watch that shit. So who knows? Well, but, I mean, what else are they going to do at 7.30 on a Wednesday but the Big Bang Theory? After that segment was the Blackpool Combat Club six-man match and the promo with the Jurassic Express and Starks and Hobbs. That did 873,000 viewers. The next segment, which had the Wardlow versus Morrissey match, 866,000 viewers. The next segment, which had the women's promo backstage, you didn't even talk about that, did you? Britt Baker and Ruby Soho and the Oh, I, I, I had zipped through so much of that by the time I noticed that the program was back on that I just, fuck it, I'm not going to back up. So that and the Adam Page promo did 863,000 viewers. Is this, is this number changing by more than 5,000 from one segment to another? 857, 873, 866, 863. So, I mean, there's a range. The next segment, which was Jericho versus Santana... Did 831,000 viewers. Jesus Christ! Then the next segment, which was the Gun Club and the Acclaimed playing with scissors, followed by the House of Black assaulting a woman, and I don't know what else was going on there. That did 828,000 viewers. The next segment, which was the... Dream match. It was the dream match and Darby and Sting that you just talked about did 773,000 viewers. Wow. I don't know whose dream. And then well, finally... A lot of this is attrition from the cumulative effect of the stinkiness of the previous hour and a half. Go ahead. The final segment was the main event, which was Mercedes Martinez versus Diana Perrazzo did 774,000 viewers. So that is a pretty tight range through the whole program. And if anybody stuck with this thing from start to finish, they are the most devoted, most forgiving AEW fan of all time. And that means that there's probably about 750,000 of those. So we kind of, because I don't think they can do a worse program. And I can't imagine why anybody would watch anything that was worse than this. So that's got to be their base audience on a Wednesday night without the Super Bowl being on the other channel or some goddamn major cataclysm occurring. It's also the first time they haven't opened up with punk's music in a while. Maybe a lot of those big bangers said, well, fuck, there's no Mussolini, there ain't no me. Maybe they indeed <laughs> said that, yes. That's right, I heard it for coming from <laughs> windows all down the street. No Mussolini, no fucking me. No Mussolini, no fucking me. I'll take my ass on down the street. Let me ask uh, Let me ask you this. Memphis wrestling, because that's probably the best comparison to modern wrestling because they have a live format and it's more than an hour. Yes. How many of those episodes ended? I mean, I don't know how much of this you'd be privy to. I'm assuming you are. How many of those episodes ended in Lawler or Jared, maybe even Dundee just said, boy, that episode sucks. We'll do better next week. Did that happen? And again, you see an episode like this, if you're in charge, what do you do for next week? Uh, well, yes, it happened. It always happens. Every once in a while, everybody hits a clinker. In the, the case of those people, they wouldn't immediately say, 
I wrote a shitty fucking television program because generally it, it they would not have, and it would have been a finish didn't come off or a, the camera crew was only a three camera shoot. So they missed the shot or somebody said something they shouldn't have said or whatever, or just, you know, the cake didn't rise. It wasn't because it wasn't really scripted and formatted that tightly to begin with. So they wouldn't say I wrote a, sh a shitty show and I'm going to do better next week. They'll say, boy, that didn't work. Or so-and-so didn't get it. Or the people just weren't into that finish or whatever. And next week's a whole different program. We got another week. We got 52 weeks this year to do it again. But on something like this, where it, a lot of the rottenness wasn't, it was avoidable by not telling these people to do these things or say these things or booking these finishes or having these things happen where it's inapplicable to nothing. A lot of that, it's, that's the problem always with AEW. It's self-inflicted wounds based on an inexperienced booker and a guy as, as the boss who lets, like you said, the inmates run the asylum. And now you find out that a lot of the ideas that wrestlers have always had were the shits. That's why they weren't allowed to do most of them. Even in the territory days, you wouldn't believe some of the stupid ideas guys had. But there was always one guy in charge to say what could or couldn't be done. And he also is the guy that personally picked his main event money drawing talent because he had faith and confidence in what they wanted to do. And... <laughs> You know, if, if Mike Boyette's on the card and he decides to be Apocalypse, the soldier of fortune, and he's fucking painting himself up like a goddamn guerrilla warfare soldier one week and a panda bear the next week, you just say, Mike, get back to the fucking gimmick or find another place to go. But these people are being allowed to do whatever they want. And... It doesn't go together. A lot of it doesn't make sense. A lot of it more is not performed properly. And there's no cohesive end goal for everything. It's just all this shit going on at the same time. So nobody in the territory days of wrestling would have written a two-hour television program where almost nothing was productive to the end goal of your business, which is whatever your big match or next pay-per-view is or whatever the case that you're trying to sell. They managed to do this here. So this is uncharted water, to answer your question, young young Brian. It's never happened before. Because, you know, I, I mean, something like this could happen in any business. If you put a cab driver in charge of NASA, if you put me in charge of the heart surgery wing at the Mayo Clinic, a lot of shit will take place when you have something, somebody in charge of something that has absolutely no experience, knowledge, or idea of what they're doing. If you, Brian, how many times you've flown in an airplane in your life? Oh, I couldn't even count. How many times have you watched movies and TV shows where people are flying airplanes? Even more than that. A great number. Okay. If you go down to LaGuardia and you get in the cockpit, you know how to start her up and take her off? No, and I would certainly not not go to LaGuardia if I could avoid it. Okay, any airport, wise ass. No, I do not know how to. Of fly. course you don't. Because watching it and riding along for the ride is a whole lot different than running the thing or flying the thing. There's a lot of head holders, but there ain't that many dog fuckers. Words to the wise. As a matter of fact... I want everybody to send that out on Twitter. That is your word of wisdom for the day as we close up the Jim Cornette experience. There's a lot of head holders out there, but there ain't a lot of dog fuckers, and they're the ones that make the world go round. You probably shouldn't tweet that out, ladies and gentlemen. Probably a bad idea. Well, that's, that's you know, the children should learn this at an early age. No, they should not. God damn it. Yes, they should. They, you should always learn that it's better to grow up to be the head, to be the dog fucker Don't than the head Don't think of owner. animals that way. Think of animals as furry little friends that keep your oh, feet yes, warm. they are. Yes. But it's always better to be the guy in the driver's seat than the guy standing there holding the collar.
That's words to the wise from Jim Cornette. Do you have any closing thoughts, Brian? <laughs> we'll see you on the drive through in a few days. There you go, folks. For Brian, I'm Jim. For the experience, thank you. Fuck you. And bye-bye, everybody.